que ya lo logró todo en grandes organizaciones de nuestro país, en Francia, que se incluyó en las diferentes días, según los otros egoístas en el resto. Y de cuatro años están más en conferencia, en el caso de un nuevo técnico, también que fue escrito en el Ministerio de Unión Europea, Antonio Mati, sobre el año de Brígani, que es posible para el Frente de Unión Europea, el Ministerio de Unión Europea, sobre el año de Brígani, el Ministerio de Unión Europea, το πρόεδρο της Επιτροπής του Προγράμματος Αριστοτέλης, καθηγητή και βουλευτή Επιτροπής κ. Δημήτρη Πατεζοβή, οι οποίοι στήριξαν την προσπάθειά μας αυτή από τα πρώτα της βήματα έως σήμερα. Θα ήθελα ακόμη να ευχαριστήσω θερμά τον Υπουργό Μαγιαδονίας και Κράτης, κ. Φίλιππο Πετσάνοπο, καθώς και τον Υπουργό Πολιτισμού, κ. Βάτιο Βενιζέρο. Χωρίς την ειδική και ειδική ενίσχυση όλων αυτών των φορέων και εξόχων, δεν θα μπορούσε να γίνει πράξη η αρχική σύλληψη του συνεδρίου. Το εγχείρημά μας αυτό έχει δύο βασικούς στόχους. Η σύνδεση της αρχαίας ελληνικής και πιο συγκεκριμένα της αριστοτελικής φιλοσοφίας με τη σύγχρονη σχέση. Και δεύτερον, η γεφύρωση του φάσματος που χωρίζει τη φιλοσοφία από την επιστήμη ύστερα από τον κατακαιρματισμό που πέστη σε ανώτερα στράμια γνώση με την αυτή ανάπτυξη των ειδικών επιστημών. Η φιλοδοξία του συνεδρίου είναι να ανοίξει νέου φορέτονε στη μελέτη τη αριστοτελική σκέψη, υπερβαίνοντα τα κλασικά χρόνια. Το έργο που θα γίνει του προσώπου θα εξεταστεί, όχι έρχεται σε ένα ουσιακό κομμάτι ανακτήμητη βιβλία αξία, αλλά θα προσπαθήσουμε να καταλήξουμε την εσωτερική συγγένεια που συνδέει την αριστοτελική φιλοσοφία με κλάδο τη σύγχρονη επιστήμη, όπω είναι η φυσική, η κυβανική φυσική, η μικροφυσική, η κοσμολογία, η αστρονομία, τα μαθηματικά, η λογική, η χημεία, η βιολογία και η ψυχολογία. Και αυτό που εγώ πιστεύω ότι είναι το νέο που παίρνει το συνέδριό μα, αλλά και αυτό που το κάνει να απευθύνεται στην επιστημονική κοινότητα με την ευρύτερη τη έννοια. Οι ποικίλε πτυχέ τη σύνδεση τη αριστοτελική σχέση με του σύγχρονου κλάδου των επιστημών θα αναπτυχθούν κατά τη διάρκεια του συνεδρίου από εξέχοντε αριστοτελιστέ, φιλοσόφου, επιστήμε και θετικού επιστήμονε. Θα ήθελα όμω από τη θέση αυτή ενδεικτικά και πάρα πολύ σύντομα να αναφερθώ στο χαρακτήρα τη προσέγγιση του θέματο σε ό,τι αφορά στο χώρο των φυσικών επιστημών. Κάτι άλλωστε το αποτέλεσε και το έναρξημα για τη σύγκληση του συνεδρίου αυτού. Θα πρέπει λοιπόν να πούμε ότι η αξία τη αριστοτελική φυσική φιλοσοφία, σε αντίθεση προ τη λογική και μεταφυσική, υποβαθμίστηκε για πολλού αιώνε έω σχεδόν τι μέρε τη. Στη στάση αυτή συνέβαλε το γεγονό ότι ο Αριστοτέλη προσεγγίστηκε μέσα από το πνεύμα και τι ιδέε που προέκυψαν από την ανάπτυξη των θετικών προεστημών, ε, από την αναγέννηση και μετά, χωρίς όμως, κυρίως όμως, μετά την επιτράξη της μεθόνιας μηχανικής. Έτσι, για παράδειγμα, ο B.H. Allen, στο κλασικό του βιβλίο The Philosophy of Aristotle, δημοσιευμένος το 1952, παρατηρείται εξή. Οι αρχές του Αριστοτέλη ήταν καλά προσαρμοσμένες στην ιστορική και βιολογική έρευνα, αλλά εξαιρετικά απέλησες για άλλες περιοχές της μελέτης της φύσης. Η αντίληψη του αυτή τον οδήγησε να χαρακτηρίσει την αλληλευτερική φυσική ως ένα σκύρο σύστημα της φυσικής επιστήμης. Παρ' όλα αυτά δεν έλεξαν και εκείνοι σημαντικοί αλληλευτερικές, οι οποίοι κατά τις τελευταίες δεκαετίες προσπάθησαν να επισημάνουν τη βαθιά συγγένεια της αλληλευτερικής φυσικής φιλοσοφίας με το νέο μοντέλο ερμηνεία τη φύση που διαμορφώνεται στη φυσική επιστήμη. Για παράδειγμα, ο G.H. Brandon, στο κλασικό του έργο Aristotle, δημοσιευμένο στα 1960, παρατηρείται εξή. Σήμερα ο Αριστοτέλη είναι αυτό που φαντάζει συχνά εξαιρετικά μοντέλο και ο Νέκτο αυτό που εμφανίζεται να έχει απλώ ιστορικό ενδιαφέρον. Άλλωστε, οι μεγάλοι φυσικοί επιστήμονε, όπω η Χάιζεπα και η Ντέβι Μπομ, με βάση τα δεδομένα που προέκυψαν στον χώρο τη γαλλική φυσική και φυσική των υποσωματείων, δεν δίστασαν να προχωρήσουν σε μια σύνδεση των αριστοτελικών κατηγοριών 
και μάλιστα τη έννοια τη δυνάμει με τη σύγχρονη φυσική. Γίνεται έτσι, όλο και περισσότερο φανερό, ότι στη φυσική επιστήμη πραγματοποιούνται στι μέρε μα βαθιέ αλλαγέ, στον τρόπο με τον οποίο οι επιστήμονε αντιμετωπίζουν τον φυσικό κόσμο, υπογραμμίζοντα έτσι την ανάγκη δημιουργία νέων μοντέλων ή εξειδικευμένων σχημάτων, τα οποία δεν μπορούν πλέον να βρεθούν στο πλαίσιο τη νευτόνια μηχανική, του μηχανιστικού δετερμινισμού και τη ατομική θεωρία τη ύλη. Εκείνο που έχει φανεί είναι ότι το μοντέλο που διαμορφώνεται στη φυσική σήμερα παρουσιάζει αρχέ αναλογίε με το αριστοτελικό, με την έννοια ότι τα νέα εξειδικευμένα σχήματα που καλούνται να χρησιμοποιήσουν οι φυσικοί για την κατανόηση του φυσικού κόσμου έχουν ένα αριστοτελικό χαρακτήρα που οδηγεί σε μια δυναμική εικόνα του φυσικού κόσμου έτσι ώστε να βρεθείτε σήμερα μια ριζική αναδιαμόρφωση όσον αφορά στι έννοιες και τα εξηγητικά σχήματα για την κατανόηση του χαρακτήρα του φυσικού κόσμου. Αυτό είναι μια διαπίστωση που αφορά καταρχήν τον τομέα τη φυσική. Επεκτείνεται όμω και σε άλλου σημαντικού κλάδου τη σύγχρονη επιστήμη, φέρνοντα την αριστοτελική σκέψη στο επίπεδο του ενδιαφέροντο. Και αυτό είναι που περιμένουμε μια ανυπομονησία μεγάλη να φανεί στο συνέδριο που αρχίζει σήμερα τη εργασία του. Που μπορεί να θυμίσει την ίδια στη θέση 
να χαιρετήσει αυτό εδώ το συνέδριο που γίνεται μέσα στο πλαίσιο των εκδηλώσεων τη χρονιά που η πόλη μα, η Θεσσαλονίκη, είναι η πρωτεύουσα, η πολιτική πρωτεύουσα τη Ευρώπη. Σα ευχαριστώ.
It is a great pleasure and a great honor and to have Hillary Clinton give the inaugural talk. Uh, his absolutely uh, was not given an introduction, but I have to say that he is one of the foremost philosophers of our times. Uh, the rates and the quality of his work uh, is extraordinary in philosophy of science and mathematics, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, even ethics and economics. A range and depth that even Aristotle would require. So please, <laughs> we are all expecting your help. Even though we are under some time pressure, I have to take a moment first to express my own gratitude that uh, being made the honorary president of the conference, uh, which is a wonderful honor, and also about the gratitude of all of the foreign guests uh, the guests from abroad at this conference, all the speakers, my speakers from abroad at this conference, who I think share with me the sense that whether, like myself, you are visiting Greece for the first time, or like John Anton, you are visiting Greece for the tenth time, you, for a philosopher, even step foot on the soil of Greece is almost uh, like stepping on a holy land. But this is one's constantly aware of the following footsteps of the very founders of my subject. And to see from my paper, this is not just a matter of reverence to the dead or reverence to the pioneers, but Aristotle, in particular, is a philosopher for whom I myself find that I continue to learn, along with uh, a few other philosophers, and I've become uh, one that I find that. I get smarter, Aristotle always gets smarter. Uh, and I will go directly to the page and not to waste time. Since the beginnings of philosophy as a subject, there's been a struggle between two very different conceptions of perception. In ancient philosophy, perception was thought of very often as applying as appearances. And the form that the struggle took in that period concerned the nature of appearances. Some classical philosophers thought of appearances as intermediaries between us and things external to the soul. For the Democritians, for example, appearances were reflections of the senses and ultimately of the soul, and the soul was thought of by the Democritians to consist of atoms albeit of a finer kind than the atoms of our bodies. And the particular sensory qualities were defined in terms of the kinds of atoms that cause them, or at least this is the account we have of the Democritians, of the resources to be sure that Theophrastus are not exactly friendly sources. The Stoics appear to have thought of appearances as some kind of little pictures in the soul which they also conceived of materialistically. For Aristotle, on the interpretation I contend, in perception and thought, the intellectual part of the soul is in direct contact with the properties of the things thought about. In modern jargon, the Democritians and the Stoics had a representational theory of perception, while the Aristotelians, according to me, were direct realists. To be sure, there are difficulties with the Aristotelian view, some of which I wrote about in a paper called Aristotle after Wittgenstein in uh, my book, uh, Words and Life. But I today will be presenting more charitable, more friendly readings of Aristotle. Those difficulties arise from the essentialism involved in the Aristotelian notion of form. And those difficulties become serious if you hold that the form of the object is in the mind when we think about the object as well as when we perceive it. It does seem that in the case of thought, the form Aristotle speaks of 
take some explaining the cards in the essence. And I still find serious difficulties with the idea that we can only think about things whose essence we know. But Gisela Stryker has suggested to me that in the case of perception, it's unlikely that Aristotle has some landed the notion of formal mind. It's plausible that the form that we receive in perception is simply the sensible form, the color or the shape or the texture or the sound or whatever. If we read Aristotle in this way, it would seem that what he's saying is simply that in perception, we are aware of the sensible properties of external things, their shape, color, and so on. It may be, of course, that Aristotle also thought that it's talk of the same thing, the form, being in two places at once, in the object perceived and also in the mind, explaining how our awareness of the sensible properties of external things is possible. If so, he was mistaken. Taken as an explanation, such a metaphysics is unhelpful, to say the least. But it's also possible, as indeed the rather strange prose of De Anima, at this point, suggests might be the case, that he's simply using a number of figures of speech, but he used a number of very different ones, to say that we really are aware of properties of external things, just as we today speak of something being in one's mind. Whatever Aristotle may have intended, and whether or not part of what he intended has to be rejected as confused, he at least believed that we do have an awareness of the sensible properties of external things, and that this is not to be cashed out as meaning that we merely have images or representations of those things before our minds, as the view that has been dominant ever since Descartes holds. And Aquinas followed Aristotle faithfully in all of this. I contend that this disagreement continues to the present day, in essence, not in the details of these issues, and that the confusion and speculation about the mind in much of contemporary cognitive science arises from a continuing allegiance to the picture of appearances, and as we shall see of thoughts as well as intermediaries, and a systematic and lack of university of the alternative. Now, that Aristotle was a direct realist is, however, challenged by Victor Kasten in both the original study of Aristotle's views on intentionality. Now, Kasten's study is not yet published. He is planning to publish a book on Aristotle and the problem of intentionality. Uh, my, most of my discussion of Kasten's views in the appendix to this paper, uh, I'll, I think we have copies made, and specialists who want to see it can have copies of the appendix as we're going to discuss the text that Kasten is reading. Kasten recognizes that Aristotle has long been read as a direct realist, as I said, by Aquinas, as well as in our day, in spite of important disagreements between us and all about the details by Joseph Owens, Miles Berniat, myself, and Richard Sirachi. Instead of the Aristotle who thought that the mind in both thought and perception is in contact with the forms themselves, Kasten proposes an Aristotle of a causal theory of reference and a causal theory of perception as well as of memory and imagination. But while there's much to be learned from Kasten's work, particularly on Kasten's uh, I think that Kasten's arguments against the direct realist interpretation of Aristotle should not be accepted. Kasten rightly points out that Aristotle's statement in De Anima 2.12 that concerning sensation in general, one must suppose that the sense is receptive of sensible forms without the matter. As when, when, as when wax receives the device of the signet ring without the iron or gold, it takes up the gold or brace of the device, but not insofar as it is gold or bronze. But that statement, which is often cited by those who hold that Aristotle said that the perception of the form itself gets in the mind, that quote from the Anima chapter 2 is not by itself precisely. He cites three difficulties with reading this as an account of the intentionality of sensation. 
Now I'm quoting from Casper. One, Aristotle seems to take the case of the wax and the signet ring to be a genuine case of receiving the form without the matter. So Casper. This has occasionally been denied, but I think it goes hard against the text. But the wax is not in an intentional state about the ring. And the quote two, another quote. Casting, there's nothing in the phrase, receiving the form without the matter, to suggest a notion of reference. How does receive without the matter a signal the notion of being about something? And three, paraphrasing my own words, the doctrine has no hope of being extended to cases of thinking about something which does not exist, since there's no informed and immaculate object involved from which to extract the form. Following these three objections, Caston develops his own extremely interesting account of how Aristotle does account for the possibility of thinking about things which do not exist, and especially for the possibility of error in memory and perception of illusion. I shall just say a few words about the motivation behind Caston's account and reserve the detailed discussion of the account for the appendix I mentioned. All three of Caston's difficulties assume that if Aristotle did make the claim that the form of the objects we perceive or even think about are both in the object and in the mind, but not in matter in the mind, he must have intended that claim as a metaphysical explanation of the intentionality of thought and reference. I began this statement by saying if that was Aristotle's intention, the explanation was unsuccessful. But as I already remarked, a more charitable interpretation is possible. On the Aristotle wasn't describing a mechanism to explain intentionality, an account of content in the jargon of present-day philosophy of language, but simply committing himself to the common sense view that in sense perception we are directly aware of properties of objects and not of representations. And that in thought, we directly conceive of properties of things and do not simply manipulate representations which are causally, cast them to say, connected with those properties of things. When I say that on the common sense view, we are directly aware of the properties of certain things. Of course, this term direct comes from the history of the symbology of the sphere of position I defend as direct realism. For reasons that those of you who read John Austin's sentence of divinity will know, it's not a very happy metaphor. But when I say that on the common sense we were directly aware of the properties of external things, I do not mean, and I'm not ascribing to Aristotle's view, that such perception isn't causally dependent on bodily processes. Indeed, Aristotle speculates in some detail, fascinating, especially that tiny treatise on memory and recollection on the nature of those bodily processes. I mean that the upshot of a successful perception is a cognitive contact with those properties themselves and not merely with some effects or representations. Similarly, when I say that in the case of thought, the common sense view is that we directly conceive of the properties of things, I don't mean, and I don't ascribe to Aristotle the view, that such is not dependent causally on bodily processes that it doesn't involve images or representations. In fact, Aristotle says explicitly, false thought involves images. I mean that the upshot of successful thinking is a cognitive contact with those properties themselves, and not simply with representations upon whose efficient causes are the things with those properties. I defend this view of the present contemporary version of the view I was trying to Aristotle on them in my newly lectures which were the September uh, 1994 issue of the Journal of Philosophy. Caston wants to read Aristotle as having a more modern view, quotes modern view, because he believes that the more modern view works. I believe that the modern view is a disaster, and that, the, and that Aristotle was thinking in a better way. But now I must leave the further discussion of Caston's interpretation of the appendix I mentioned, and turn to contemporary minds. Although no modern representational theory would suppose that in perception, what we are directly aware of are literally little images in the sense of physical likenesses, as 
some accounts both the democracy and the second story did. Wilfred Sellers pointed out in a very famous essay, Empiricism and the Philosophy of Mind, that the picture that underlies representational theories up to the present day is of an inner theater or inner movie screen. On this conception, the colors we see, to use Barclay's famous phrase, and also Bertrand Russell's, are not properties of the external objects, but are properties of the images on the inner movie screen. Indeed, the objects we directly see, another phrase for one of the British epistemologists, are only objects in the inner theater or on the inner movie screen. It is this picture that direct reals have always been concerned to combat. Indeed, as I've already indicated, direct realism is best thought of not as a theory of perception, but as a denial of the necessity for positive internal representation in thought and memory and perception, and also a denial of the explanatory value of positive internal representations in thought and perception. The disagreement between the two conceptions that began in ancient philosophy continued in the Middle Ages. After Descartes, however, the situation changed drastically. Direct realism practically vanished from the scene until the 20th century when William James and the American New Realists, led by Perry, defended it in a novel form. Then it disappeared again until Austin's vigorous defense of the common sense direct realism is sensed in Pennsylvania. Although in the past few years, both John McDowell and I myself have defended variety of direct realism, the dominant view of Anglo American philosophy of mind today appears to be what we may call Cartesianism, quote, materialism. That is to say, a combination or melange of Descartes' own conception of the mind as an inner theater with materialism. I believe that the problems of philosophy that have become, quote, traditional since Descartes' time all rest on the mistaken conception of perception. On this so-called traditional conception, what we are cognitively related to in perception is not people and furniture and landscapes, but representations. These inner representations are supposed to be related to the people and furniture and landscapes we ordinarily claim to see and touch and hear, etc., only as inner effects to external causes. And how these how they manage to determinately represent anything remains mysterious in spite of hundreds of valiant attempts, heroic attempts, to both, by both realists, so-called, and anti-realists, so-called, to clear up the mystery. Although I will not repeat here the arguments I offer with Dewey lectures, I believe that it's only by giving up this picture of perception as mediated by a set of representations in an inner theater that we will ever be able to escape from the endless recycling of positions that do not work, or oscillation of these positions that do not work in the philosophy of mind, not to mention traditional epistemology and traditional metaphysics. A recycling or oscillation has been going on for at least four centuries. If the picture of the mind as an inner theater has had disastrous consequences, for the philosophy of perception, as I believe it has, it has had equally disastrous consequences for would be scientific speculation about the nature of meaning and thought. For Aristotle, I claim, thought as well as perception involves a direct contact with the properties of the objects thought about. Descartes himself may have had a similar view, but with a more platonic cast. For Descartes, the universals are native to the mind itself and do not require to be abstracted from experience and particulars. But once Descartes' notion of the mind as an inner theater is naturalized, for example, by identifying the mind with the brain, which already happened with the de Vol and La Mette, the objects of thought will vanish from the inner theater, and in their place we now find only representation whose connection to what they represent seems an insoluble puzzle. The result, I believe, is not scientific progress, 
deeper and deeper sinking into confusion. But rather than leave this claim unsupported by any example, and thus as a mere dogmatic statement on my part, I shall illustrate what I mean by examining in detail one attempt to identify the comments of thoughts with scientifically describable, quote, semantic representations, unquote, that of Noam Chomsky. However, in considerations I should bring to bear against Chomsky's particular version of this idea, will bear against the whole idea that concepts or thoughts are objects, let alone scientific objects. Chomsky's view features, famously, the controversial claim that our linguistic skills are innate. This is not the feature of view that I shall discuss today, although I shall begin by asking what exactly that's supposed to mean. In Chomsky's own development, it has meant different things at different times. This is often overlooked. The, the meaning Chomsky attaches to the innate hypothesis has changed radically over a 25 year period. Early on, the claim of innateness was that the rules of something called universal grammar are represented in the brain. Thus, 20 plus years ago, Chomsky was happy to write. Oh, sorry, this is, uh, no, those are the three points we have to check out to this collection. Twenty-five years ago, Chomsky was happy to write. With the progress of science, we may come to know something of the physical representation of the grammar and language faculty. As the grammar itself is physically represented, its rules are represented. Correspondingly, the cognitive state involved in language learning and the initial state in which there is a representation of UG, universal grammar, but of no specific grammar corresponding to UG. The idea, the idea that there is a representation of UG, universal grammar, in the initial state was later dropped by Chomsky. It came with the severe philosophical principle when Chomsky said to us, I didn't drop it because of the philosophical criticism of the positive empirical evidence. He now agrees that it isn't necessary to suppose that the rules of the postulated universal grammar are themselves recorded in the brain. This was the original enabled hypothesis. It's only necessary, he says now, to suppose that the brain is so composed that when it functions according to what he called its competence, the speaker uses language in accordance with the rules of universal grammar, not that he represents them. And that the differences between the surface grammars of the various natural languages can be explained by supposing that certain parameters get set differently as a result of speakers growing up in one linguistic environment or another. Thus, in 1988, we find it, 25 years later, we find him writing, we may think of the language faculty as a complex and intricate network of some sort associated with a switch box consisting of an array of switches that can be set in one of two positions. Unlike, uh, unless the switches are set one way or another, the system does not function. When they are set in one of the permissible ways, then the system functions in accordance with its nature, but differently depending on how the switches are set. This fixed network is the system of principles of universal grammar. The switches are the parameters to be fixed by experience. The data presented to the child learning the language must be sufficient to set the switches one way or another. When these switches are set, the child is commanded of a particular language and knows the facts of the language. That a particular expression has a particular meaning and so on. So that means all possible meanings are determined in advance by the possible positions of the switches.
In current versions of the Anagus hypothesis, for example, the Imago lecture, which I just quoted, the emphasis is not on the representation of rules, but on the hypothesis of what Chomsky refers to as a language organ, or a system of language modules. The idea is that just as there are certain organs, the hands, which are innately adapted to certain tasks, like grasping or picking up or manipulating, so there are mental organs, brain organs, subpersonal processors in the brain, which have evolved to carry out various linguistic tasks and the structure of language, the universal grammar, is just a reflection of the computational structure of these modules, the computational structure of the language organ. In the next section, I shall try to show that the claim that the, quote, particular meaning, unquote, other writers like Jerry Fuller refer to this as the narrow content or the semantic representation. We claim that this the semantic representation of each word can be defined, described by specifying the values of a finite list of parameters is deeply problematic. To do this, I now turn to the relevance of Gödel's celebrated second incompleteness theorem. <coughs> the Gödel theorem. I can imagine some of you thinking of what possible relevance is that. But actually, the relevance is fairly immediate. First of all, Chomsky's claim is a claim about the meanings of all words. So if it's correct, it applies also to the word proof, or I shall say demonstration, reminding me that I'm talking about logical mathematical proof, and not about empirical proof. That's when we speak of proving that the subject is guilty, the suspect is guilty. Presumably, just about anyone can learn a tiny bit of geometry or a tiny bit of arithmetic and can learn to use the word demonstration in connection with the kinds of reasoning that go on there. But perhaps I'm already moving too quickly. Although Chomsky does not believe that there's such a thing as general intelligence, he does believe that there's such a thing as the scientific faculty. Perhaps he would say that all the most words require only the language organ to learn, it requires a scientific faculty, which is supposed to work much more slowly and not to be as equally developed in all speakers of the language organ to learn such words as demonstrated. However, Chomsky holds that the scientific faculty, too, is modularized, and for the same sorts of reasons that he says in the case of the language organ, the failure of behaviorism, what he thinks of as the failure of connectionism, that's hotly disputed, that the connectionism has failed, and the existence of universal generalizations that cannot be otherwise explained. Since my argument is against the modularity of the quote, particular meaning of the word demonstrate, it doesn't matter for my purposes whether the supposed module is to be part of a language organ or part of the quote, scientific faculty. Quite simply, the argument is that if Chomsky is right, and we could in principle, we, we could in principle describe our confidence in the use of the word demonstrate recursively. And that would mean we could recursively enumerate, uh, recursively enumerate, or recursively enumerate this mathematical form for things that could be listed by a computer which is allowed to run forever. So this is to say we put in, in principle a computer, which is what a module is, or what the language organ is supposed to be, would simply list all the truths of the say elementary number theory that the human mind can demonstrate. At this point, we must be careful not to make the error that some writers, like Roger Penrose in the Shadows of the Mind, has made. I'm not following you. I'm not arguing that Bernstein shows that the mind cannot be a computer. Uh, it's tempting to argue, as Penrose does, that the consistency of this set of truths would then be one more arithmetical truth that we could demonstrate contradicting Bernstein's theorem. That's not the argument. That's, I've shown that that argument is fallacious. We can argue along a different path. Let's assume that Chomsky is right. That a purely mathematical statement that's 
procedure who makes no performance errors can demonstrate is the output of a computationally describable module. In other words, the service would persevere the loop. That's a nice technical jargon, or can in principle be written down by a computer, which is thought to continue making computations and writing down the results forever. We shall also assume that any purely mathematical statement that a speaker who makes no performance errors can demonstrate is true. That certainly seems to be part of our concept, so error and demonstration. Then although the consistency of the recursively enumerable set of statements that can demonstrate to be true is not itself one that we can demonstrate to be true, even with the aid of this assumption, because we have used empirical knowledge to define the set precisely, still, if we can know the description of the set in question, the consistency statement is one we can empirically justify. But now we can run a Bertillian argument again, this time using the notion of empirical justification instead of the notion of demonstration. And we can say that if we can describe our confidence in the use of the notion justified given evidence in e recursively, as we should be able to do on Chomsky's picture of the mind, the result will be a real contradiction. Upshot of these Gradelian reflections is not the Roger Penrose Holmes law, a proof that the performance of the brain as a whole cannot be simulated by a Tory community, but it is a proof that if there's a recursive description of our confidence in the use of such epistemic notions as demonstrate and justify, then it's beyond our powers, our powers in principle, and not to stay back or to know that description. I should have that way, but I think that the notion of confidence is itself a badly confused attempt to fudge the norm, the description between the normative and the descriptive. In recent publications, I've argued that at least at present, Example my argument in the uh, Cambridge Companion in Philosophy of Mind, the article under my name. I've argued that at least at present, the functionalist program that is computational, computing machine functionalism, is empty. Empty because the notion of a computational description of meaning presupposes that we have at least an idea of what a possible form of such a description might be. Lacking such a description, the notion of a computational state becomes a we know not what. It cannot, of course, be ruled out a priori that in the future someone will come up with a definite proposal with a computational formalism that would at least the first step towards a genuine research program for describing propositional attitudes in such a formalism. But can anything at all be ruled out a priori? Do we have a metaphysical guarantee that in the future no one will give an intelligible sense of the claim of two and two or something like six? Is the notion of such a guarantee even an intelligible one? But the fact that someone may give a proposition to be an intelligible sense no more implies that P now has an intelligible sense than the fact that I might someday learn to play the violin implies that I now know how to play the violin. Lacking a coherent body of theory, which the claims propositional attitudes are complicated computational states of the organism of environment, or two of whom sometimes six, belongs. The idea that we now understand the claims presupposes a platonic picture of understanding and a completely freestanding ability, a mystery mental act. In the case of the proposal, the scientific faculty is self modularized <coughs> and that our scientific confidence can be completely recursively described by what Chomsky has some terms in conversation. This is what he believes. The situation is even worse than in the case of my own former functionalist proposals. There, there 
appearance of no contradiction in the idea that we might someday get a content to talk of the computational description of the states in question. If a proposal that we do not know how to cash out, do not know how to take even the first step to investigate, and this is what I claim the proposal that computational attitudes are computational states to be, is a mere we know not what. What do we say about a proposal that we know would never be cashed out? The notion of a recursive description of our scientific faculty is totally vacuous. What my, what my revealing argument shows is that there's at least one concept which we're able to acquire, but such that there is not no describable module whose structure in a grammar, so to speak, completely captures our confidence in the use of the notion. In short, either something is wrong with the modularity hypothesis or something is wrong with the notion of competence. But none of this goes against the thought that there may be significant universal generalizations to be made about how human speakers do and do not employ the notions of demonstration and justification. But let's reflect on Chomsky's example a little further. How might Chomsky convey the argument I just gave? What follows are some reflections triggered by that question. First, he might reject the confidence performance distinction, or he's not blind to it. And he might say that what's at stake is the existence of a module responsible for our performance, not the description of our confidence. That would short circuit my argument, but that's not a real option for Chomsky or for modern linguistics itself, for that matter. From syntactic structures on, the arguments for the existence of linguistic universals have presupposed that that distinction is in place, as have the later arguments for modularity. To appreciate why that's so, it suffices to employ Wittgenstein's discussion of following a simple and arithmetical rule as keep adding two to the number you started with. If we're not allowed to prescind from performance errors, if the very notion of a performance error were not allowed, then we couldn't even say that what the speaker does when given the number 11 is to produce the sequence 13, 15, 17, etc. That's not what the speaker does in every slip of the tongue. Well, every response prompted by fatigue, every failure to remember the preceding digits correctly, is taken to be part of the output we are asked to account for. When we postulate, and Stephen says, uh, when we postulate a simple process under an idealized description, according to which what the process does is to error, without error, error of speak, perform the calculation, and is followed by n plus 2. That's what Wittgenstein calls using the machine as symbol, as opposed to thinking about an actual machine as the engineer does. When we think of such an idealized machine as the process responsible for producing the series, we've already decided to discount any occasion on which the speaker makes a mistake. Say, he says uh, that 2, 2, 2, 6, 3, 4, plus 2 is 2, 2, 6, 3, 6. That's discovered as a performance error. The whole structure of linguistic theory and cognitive science presupposes that the confidence performance distinction is in place. Two, a better line of argument against the relevance of my Romelian considerations would be to insist on the distinction between linguistic confidence and scientific confidence, and to jettison the idea of a recursive characterization of the latter, of scientific confidence, but not of the former. Indeed, such a distinction is contained in Chomsky's own distinction between the language organ and the scientific faculty. At first blush, that would seem to lose the trick. For we can then say that to know the meaning of them in space, we don't have to be able to follow complex proofs. You don't have to possess mathematical competence. Someone who follow one of the very simplest arithmetical or logical or geometrical arguments can easily show that he understands the word if what is included in our grasp of the literal meaning of demonstrate is limited enough, no Cordelian argument can get started. The Cordelian arguments presuppose an understanding of methodological reasoning, and other things like mathematical induction. 
The Gadirian Army, by Kirby, does indeed explode the plane compared to a personally surveyable scientific faculty. The marshal, the linguist on the street, or the psychologist on the street, or the philosopher on the street, or the apparatus. Follow Chomsky in that than the metaphysical speculation. But now a different problem arises. The very fact that I just suggested we exploit the overt threat of the Gadirian Army, arguments, however strange it may seem, Use them into a lecture on the philosophy of mind are nevertheless perfectly appropriate when the notion of confidence becomes as utopian as it is in Chomsky's picture of the mind. The fact that we acquire very little of speakers when it's just a question of knowing the literal meaning of the word demonstrate and not of exhibiting some idealized confidence in demonstrating mathematical truths, that fact cannot realistically be separated from such other familiar facts as the fact that no one thinks set of skills. Linguistic skills and the non-linguistic skills interwoven with them is required before we can say that the speaker knows the meaning of demonstrate or need of any word. For even the speaker exhibits a lot of skill in using the word. Some further <coughs> corpus may reveal that he does not, after all, have the concept we thought he had. If a speaker one day refuses to call something a demonstration because the Dalai Lama does not approve of it, we may have to revise our whole account of the meaning of this lexical item in his idiolect. This is, of course, the notorious problem of meaning holism. To this stark response of anti holism is to say that what is holistic is only the process of finding out what the meaning actually is. But they say meaning itself is its holistic. For well, any moments often accept a distinction between what they call wide content and what they call narrow content. Only narrow content has to do with the language organ, they say. Wide content depends on causal connections to the environment as well. To describe narrow content is to describe one particular aspect of the language organ. But what aspect? If there is no one fixed positive use of the word, it is a matter of interpretation whether a speaker uses the word confidently or not. Then seeking a module or whatever which accounts for the positive use is worse than a search for we know not what. It is out of confusion. Three, this is a good occasion for about a common but absurd anti holist argument, cursing the photo of our ethical forest. Quote, we attack on meaning holism. In quote, meaning holism. It is often argued that if holism were true, every change in a speaker's beliefs would count for change in the meaning of his words. But that is a fallacy. Real live holists, as opposed to straw men, maintain that the meaning of the word is not an object at all. The question should not be what the meanings are, but what form the description of the reference and use of words had best take for linguistic purposes and psychological purposes. My own idea of a meaning vector and the meaning of meaning was such a proposal. Well, both have different answers to that question. Why and Davidson respectively think that the answer is the cursive translation scheme for the language and the Tarski style of truth theory for language. On any whole theory, the right description is a function of the whole actual and potential corpus of utterances in context. But it does not follow that the meaning must change, that is, the description must change every time the corpus changes. This is by concluding that the fact that the least common multiple of a billion numbers is a function of all of them, that it must change whenever any one of them changes. That would be a valid argument if every function were one to one. But meaning holders do not claim that the correct meaning descriptions are one to one functions of the corpus. Four, if what I've been arguing is right, if such notions as narrow content, semantic component of universal grammar, mental representation of the concept, are one and all completely empty, it is high time. We took seriously Wittgenstein's warning in the next to the last paragraph of philosophical investigations that, quote, the confusion and barrenness of psychology is not to be explained by calling it a young science. Its state is not comparable with that of physics, for example, in its beginnings, 
from psychology are experimental methods and conceptual confusions. Just a brief one on that. The idea that there is a scientific problem, quote, the nature of mind, presupposes the picture of the mind and its thoughts, or contents, as objects, so that investigating the nature of thought is just like investigating the nature of water or heat. I want to suggest that philosophy can expose this presupposition as a confusion. There are, to be sure, empirical facts about thought as about everything else. And science can reasonably hope to discover new and even some very surprising empirical facts. But the idea that these facts, or some of them, must add up to something called an account of the nature of mind is an illusion, one of the dominant illusions of a certain part of contemporary science. For uh, offering us uh, talks today, one more significant contribution, both to our study studies and the philosophy of mind. I'm sure this talk will uh, stimulate discussion, which will transcend the place of life in our present uh, session. We can have a short discussion in about uh, 10 or 15 uh, minutes, uh, and uh, we can open the discussion. Yes, that's a very good answer. Uh, which I think is an English 
complex, overlapping, mutually dependent set of buildings. Some more autonomous than others, some will be shared with articles, some will be built, and so on. There, it also has abilities which cannot be individuated without looking at the environment in which the organ exists, in which it functions. For example, for Aristotle, one of the functions of the soul is digestion. And if you don't look at what the organism takes in and what it excretes and so on, how it fits into an ecological niche, you only were allowed to look at the body of the organism, you would never know that it digested. You didn't allow them to have food, you didn't have a research organs. So I think that there's a, I think that the one who has, can we make empirical generalizations about these abilities? Of course we can. And on many different levels, including, I, I would include clinical psychology. I, I don't think of the Freud was wrong with people who was going to talk science on model physics. I by no means dismiss all talk of the unconscious, depression, etc. As without empirical and spiritual value, social psychology, and many different levels. But it's to study the mind, it's to study how we think, how we perceive, and so on. It, but what's happened from, it's a feature of psychology, and it's as human. We forget about it, human as well. We're taking terribly seriously as psychologists in the long time, or even more seriously as psychologists than as philosophers. The number of, the amount of uh, secondary books on the association of ideas in the 18th century, those in the thousands, the sweat they wrote. And every 50 years, somebody has announced a quote, uh, Newtonian revolution in psychology. Finally, we put psychology or sometimes it's sociology or economics on the path of looking like physics. And I see no progress in that direction. My name is Patricia Grayson from Colorado University in the United States. I would like to ask, it sounds to me somewhat paradoxical um, to hear from a philosopher of mind that the promise of the answer to questions raised in the philosophy of mind is an illusion. So I'd like to ask you what future you see to philosophy of mind and what future you see to the possibility of a continued philosophy of mind given the illusion of promise of its answer. And secondly, if you take Aristotle's line seriously, that to know is to become one with the thing, that to know is to become one with the thing known, how is it possible that human thinking can fail to become one then with itself? Thank you. The question is there any room for progress in philosophy of mind? I think that what we're seeing in philosophy, first of all, I myself think that every part of philosophy, in one way or another, depends on the other part of philosophy. I do with more, I mean, quite against this my own department, but in graduates, we sometimes do try to tell them that, what are you going to take in terms of this course? I tell you on the ethics side. And we are, all I want to find, are horrified when you hear students talking that way. In particular, the problems I described, the problems raised from the picture mind has been clear, are as much problems in metaphysics and epistemology as they are in philosophy of mind. And I think that what we're seeing is not now progress, but positions which every one of which was, was familiar to Immanuel Kant when he wrote the prize essay before the critical period. There's nothing new in this causal theory of reference, representational, as many of these quite good versions of the ancients. It is only progress I can hear must make. Progress sometimes consists in seeing that all of the imposing positions that one cited in the share a common premise which has to be questions. And I said, if we can do that, I guess we can on my new lectures, then we will see our way out of great many models, including I think by the models that might lead to my own anti-realism. Again, my simple as a real theory, which I think I now see is directly drawing from a representational view of the mind. I think that the whole idea that both 
any realism and realism are with us. If the common sense reaction, then the next step should be then why the fuck is it they are two alternatives? As far as the idea of Aristotle and the knowledge of mind becomes one of the subject, that of course doesn't mean that Aristotle didn't say that error was possible, but he does have a sophisticated account of error which can cause uh, at least two elements. Here. This, this is the assumption, the argument that the reason, 
Those are the plot of this section that you can so you, you take it over the in case of green, and you say it's it seemed to me that I was uh, having a broken perception of perceiving time. And what we said for the fact that, at least judging on my dreams, no dream was really exactly like that. Except at least it seems to me. But then they are playing the contrary. What's the most that he did as his gift of having totally black and white dreams? I can't exclude that as a request. The so then the argument comes, well, you can explain why it seems to you that you're seeing a lie, and you're not seeing a lie, by supposing that in both cases, there is what John McDonald is called the highest common factor, otherwise called a sense datum, an impression, various terms. It's interesting how lots of people are uncomfortable with the current term and changes in every 25 years, which suggests that it's a sense of discomfort from the beginning of it. But now, if the highest, if say that A and B seem to be the same experience, then there must be, that's because something, the appearance, which is the same, requires that there be objects, these appearances, for which the principle SAS and Kippy, the difference between the SA, the essence, and the appearance, is true. But there are no such objects because the appearances, the closest thing that one identity relation is indistinguishability. And indistinguishability is not transit. I can spell it out for one, I think I could argue that there may be brain states, which is all of perceptual states, on which perception is causally dependent, but can also seeming to perceive when we don't need to see, it's also causally dependent. But they cannot obey the principle of essays for Kippy. They must be such that you can be in two different ones without being able to distinguish them. And that means they ain't sense data and they ain't the highest common factor that this model is possible. Again, the idea that we can simply combine a philosophy of mind that came from ideals with materials. Which has been around since Peter and Lyman Tweed. It's crazy. It's a very bad fit between the idealist objects and the objects of brain science. And amazingly, one doesn't look that close. But I can talk later on. It's not a lot of time to go to that. Professor, I have a remark for you, Understanding pursuing intellectual questions for their own sake. 
Both have to be kept, and both have to be kept in relation to one another. Uh, I think that clearing up what I described as confusions in the philosophy of mind directly feeds to the clearing up confusions in metaphysics and epistemology, which in turn underlie widespread cultural views, for example, the belief in an absolute fact value of that value, which have very major consequences in how we think about ethics and politics. I think one can see how the philosophy becomes more than, say, just Wittgenstein and therapists and all, only by seeing the relation of all of its parts, how so called confusions in one area become substantive ideologies uh, in another. Uh, I think we can bring to the end of our discussion for this session, but I'm sure it will continue uh, after the session and after the, the conference. Uh, I would like to thank again the professor Bantam and all the participants.
manifeste un caractère qu'on a signé subjectif. Mais la flèche de sa théorie de la relativité ouverte a eu rapidement des effets grâce au modèle de l'idéalisation du Gilman, renforcé d'abord par peur qui mesure le décalage des galaxies vers le rouge, et par Pentias et Wilson qui défend une théorie de l'éloignement individuel des corps noirs. Cette théorie a permis de découvrir dans l'univers du père une immense quantité de désordre, dont le degré d'information varie. Et d'autre part, l'émergence d'un ordre au cours de l'utilisation chaotique d'un système. Le mérite de la thermodynamique est d'avoir restitué dans la suite et dans ce nouveau contexte de résolution une théorie de l'irrespectabilité rapprochant la physique de l'expérience quotidienne du temps. Ricochet, les de Bruxelles ont montré que l'évolution du système doit être définie, compris d'abord l'irrespectabilité des processus de thermodynamique. Ensuite, le caractère imprédictif. Et enfin, l'émergence de structures organisées, qualifiées de structures dispatives, dont l'entropie diminue à l'intérieur du système, tout en augmentant en ses échanges avec l'extérieur. Cela signifie, et c'est cela qui m'intéresse maintenant, que l'auto-organisation des structures, compatissant les systèmes suivants, n'est pas aussi exceptionnelle qu'on le croyait encore récemment. Je pense que c'est un peu à mon nom. Et que la nature ne tend pas nécessairement à prédéfiner ni à faire des ordres. Les configurations du passage d'un ordre au désordre et d'un désordre à un ordre sont possibles, suscitant l'action de plusieurs types de flèches de temps qu'on qualifie de gravitationnel, de thermodynamique, de technologie, et ainsi de suite. Sans penser dans les détails de ces acquis, auxquels nous ont aujourd'hui d'autres domaines de recherche, comme le théorie du chaos et des catastrophes, on peut dire que ce qui est nouveau, au point de vue philosophique, je parle, je ne dis pas au point de vue philosophique, au point de vue philosophique, c'est que l'irrésistibilité temporelle n'est plus envisagée comme une perspective subjective pour limiter relativement à des processus qui en soi se lèvent de la Mais il s'inscrit en droit dans la complexité des processus du réel qu'on le dit. On arrive même de plus en plus à constater que les modèles de l'irrésistibilité sont parfois théoriques et aident surtout à donner des conditions d'intelligibilité des choses en dehors de la nécessité de réalité. Tout se passe comme si la science contemporaine se donnait de nouvelles conditions de réflexion pour la fondation de l'irrésistibilité du temps s'accorder davantage que dans le passé à l'expérience des biens du temps dont le caractère irréversible n'est pas sur rapport avec la visibilité. Bien plus, en tenant compte des diversité d'expérience du temps, comme celle des dommages biologiques ou celle plus complexe de la psychologie, en particulier en fonction de la théorie de la formation, un éclatement de la théorie du temps devient une éventualité de l'économie pour les soleils plus difficiles. Comme dans la question de la théorie du temps, une multiplicité d'approches sans possible, en dehors même du temps historique ou du temps subjectif, l'éventualité d'une multiplicité d'approches du temps n'est pas assurée. Nous l'apprenons que les Grecs avaient déjà porté pour cette efficacité en pratiquant au moins trois concepts de temps. Kronos, Kronos, Eon et Kairos ou Teros. C'est en posant le problème de cette façon qu'une interprétation sur la pensée d'Aïsson devient impressionnante, en dépit des caractères étranges comme sa cosmologie. En effet, si l'on considère, et ensuite on, on se réfère à la satisfaction entre le monde lunaire et le monde supralunaire, en y ajoutant sa tête de l'éternité du monde et, et la stabilité intrinsèque de ce récit, on est aussitôt confronté à une abolie concernant la pertinence même d'une interrogation sur sa conception du temps. Si je choisis de traiter ce thème dans ce colloque, c'est parce qu'il me semble philosophiquement intéressant, précisément parce qu'il peut paraître à première vue par la salle. Il faut en effet se rappeler que si le fait que d'autres modèles cosmologiques anciens, comme celui d'Alexandre, par exemple, serait plus pertinent pour la science contemporaine, c'est Aristote qui montre pas la première fondation scientifique du temps. 
Et donc, à mes métiers, il y a un tâche de paradoxe. Je rappelle aussi que l'approche à l'histoire du temps présente à son avantage la capacité de faire des dates d'expérience familiale et de faire du temps. Enfin, je crois que le secret de l'histoire est pu assumer dans sa métier deux caractéristiques, avec des points différents. Donc aussi, deux types de temps permettent de réfléchir le sens d'une pluralité de temps. Cette ouverture, cette ouverture sur l'enfant du fait qu'il entend également en trois types de temps. Le temps pour qu'il se fasse qui requiert des multiples conditions, comme c'est le cas dans l'action et dans la réunion. Bref, c'est le fait qu'il y a avec plusieurs concepts de temporalité qui rendent les yeux de l'élan une des plus choses avancées. Si on se limite à cette vue du temps, qui est appelée la guerre entre le temps et le mouvement, et qui définit le temps comme la mesure du mouvement, on peut constater dans ce jeu son accord avec la théorie des réversibilités du temps. La première définition de la histoire de l'homme du temps précise ce qu'il est le nom du mouvement selon l'antérieur et le procédure. Cela se comporte à sa théorie du mouvement qui considère que le but est vu à partir d'un point de départ vers un point d'arrivée. De ce point de vue, théoriser du temps et extérieur du temps manifeste quelque chose de commun. Et toute la nature du temps est fondée sur l'expérience du temps dans le cadre du mouvement expropié. C'est pourquoi le nature du temps dépend de la précision de l'antérieur de postérieur dans le mouvement et la connaissance du temps dépend du mouvement lorsqu'on définit l'antérieur de postérieur. Deux conseils deviennent dès lors importants dans cette analyse, la grandeur de la communauté. En tant qu'une optique à un déplacement, déploiement et un déplacement entre un antérieur et un postérieur, le mouvement se trouve très grandeur. Ce qui envoie la mesure au lieu est dans le cas du mouvement de translation au lieu pour une position. Lorsqu'un stop fait du temps, il porte ainsi davantage son attention sur le mouvement selon le lieu. Mettant au second plan des sources de forme du mouvement, comme l'altération ou l'accroissement et le décroissement, ainsi que le changement selon le siat, la danse ou la substance voulez, c'est-à-dire la génération de la Mais si on avait dit ce temps, je pense que le temps est également applicable à ces différents changements. L'intégration de ces changements dans une théorie générale du temps, fondée sur le mouvement, soulève une difficulté, puisque pour Aristote, la génération ne sont pas du mouvement. Ces difficultés s'empêchent une fois qu'on tient compte d'une autre théorie de la celle de la génération spontanée, que l'on écrit souvent alors qu'elle est au centre de sa pensée, comme phénomène d'auto-organisation qui pouvait, par ces difficultés même, ouvrir à une belle dérogation sur le temps. Bon, certains pourraient se demander pourquoi elle se se permet ce coup de force qui confère au mouvement selon les lieux du côté. La réponse se trouve dans la distinction qu'il me connaît entre le monde supplémentaire et le monde supplémentaire. Car le mouvement du monde supérieur est précisément le mouvement de l'orientation circulaire, mais applicable aux dossiers, aux dossiers, aux états secondaires, et que ce mouvement, le plus populaire qu'il existe, est qualifié de premier mouvement. Comme tel, ce dernier devient une mesure de toute forme de mouvement. Cette précision, bien connue, a pourtant été mal comprise jusqu'ici, car on n'a pas insisté suffisamment sur le sens de ce qui constitue une mesure, ce qui est mesure sur les autres. En effet, si un histoire constitué est un mesure au sens de Pythagoras, c'est-à-dire de l'homme mesure de toute chose, il aurait pu situer la perception comme mesure du mouvement. À ce titre, on dirait que le fait de situer le temps à partir de la perception, c'est là que l'intelligence humaine devient des conditions du temps. Il est fait qu'Aristote reconnaît que si le temps présente un lien avec le mot, nous devons considérer quelque chose, en l'occurrence là, sinon, ce qui conduit à la possibilité d'une manifestation subjective du temps. Développé surtout plus tard, la salle de Bustin est calme. Mais pour l'Aristote, l'homme n'est pas le mieux. Tout simplement, il lui reconnaît un rôle important dans les mesures du temps et du mouvement, mais sans le détruire à la par l'intelligence. Le rôle de la perception s'appuie du seul fait qu'il y a de l'antérieur et du postérieur. Comme il 
nous distinguons pas l'intelligence, les extrémités religieuses, et que l'homme qui place qu'il n'y a plus d'un sens, l'entrégueur et le possédeur. Un homme, nous disons, est cet acte de temps. Car ce qui est limité par le temps, par les tête de temps. C'est en ce sens que le temps est le nom du mouvement, le nom de l'entrégueur et le possédeur. La partition, ici du nom, par la logique à la grandeur relativement au mouvement, n'est pas que c'est le nom qui devient désormais la mesure de toute chose à la place de la perception, comme l'on est soutenu les adeptes du panélisme. Aristote affirme que par le nom, il, faut, il ne faut pas entendre le moyen de nom et le nom grand, mais le nom plat et le nom plé. Le nom est d'ailleurs ce qui fait ici de l'enseignement du postérieur qui lui-même est en rapport avec les notions du continu, du consécutif, de subsidiarité, ainsi de suite, qui sont rapportées, et là je insiste, hein, dans le livre de la Ménalité, à la question de l'un, ou l'un, de l'un. Or, comme je l'ai montré dans plusieurs de mes études, la tête s'en place de l'Aristotélie, et celle qui a vu que ce n'est pas l'homme qui est la mesure de toute chose, ni Dieu, mais l'un. Aristote montre, dans ce livre de qu'il existe quatre mots fondamentaux de référence à l'homme, comme mesure de toute chose. Il y a d'abord le mouvement, où la forme la plus importante est celle justement du mouvement de transformation circulaire. Ensuite, il y a le tout relativement partout. Ensuite encore, la notion de la définition. Et enfin, l'individualité d'espèce, de genre et d'analyse. Qu'on puisse de ce point de vue la problématique du temps dans la physique. Je comprends qu'on devrait être apporté à un état de ultime, de mesure ultime. À une réalité de mesure ultime qui est le mouvement de transformation circulaire. Le plus à exprimer est la continuité. Mais relativement au mouvement par le c'est la continuité qui se déploie en ce moment et postérieur. C'est le maintenant, l'instant, le début, qui est en tant qu'il appartient à l'homme, qui est la mesure. L'instant qui est soit mesure le temps en tant qu'antérieur et postérieur, il précise du moins, en rapportant cette problématique du mouvement de l'eau de Dieu, le voilà, le temps est le nom de la translation, et l'instant est au sens de ce qui est transporté, l'unité du nom. Donc, nous allons voir ce qui est transporté, l'unité du nom. De sorte que grâce à l'instant, le temps est à la fois continu et divisé, c'est l'eau de point de vue pour l'envisage. Cette explicitation nous semble importante, car tout en précisant l'importance de l'homme pour mesurer de toutes choses, en l'occurrence, selon un type particulier de l'idée, est encore aussi à la mesure de l'idée, ce qui fait état du contenu en dehors de toute division, c'est-à-dire la transformation de l'idée. Nous découvrons ainsi comment le sol va bien apporter la science de l'idée du temps, en rapportant la mesure du temps au mouvement stable. Cependant, cette observation ne doit pas occuper les difficultés de la compte lorsqu'on cherche à intégrer ensemble les différents modes de changement selon les différents facteurs. Seul le mouvement au forme au lieu sans s'accorder sans difficulté avec cette perspective. Pour sortir de ces difficultés, il faut faire la base supplémentaire et constater que relativement au mouvement parfait de translation circulaire, les mouvements du monde tribunal mettent en jeu un temps extatique qui produit en fin de compte la description, puisque tout phénomène de devenir dans nos vies à la Ce qui permet à l'histoire de gagner que c'est le temps de temps que toutes les choses s'engendrent et se prolongent. Or, le caractère extratique du temps ne doit pas dissimuler le fait qu'il y a également engendrement et organisation de ces temps naturels pour les produits de la vie. Il est plus dur que les hommes ne devient en efficace comme dans le diplôme de l'Union de cette capacité qui a pris son temps. Alors que c'est voir au livre 2 du décès que lorsqu'on parle de fin de l'Ethos, relativement à un mouvement continu, on ne peut se limiter au sens ordinaire qu'on fait l'Ethi de Moël pour la mort, c'est-à-dire de l'Ethi, lorsqu'il est dit qu'il atteint le thème pour lequel il est né. Il faut aussi se tenir compte d'une finalité plus essentielle de l'Ethi, celle qui correspond à une substitution de l'Ethi constitutif de ce en vue du voyant mouvement, c'est-à-dire la fin de la vigueur de l'Église. Mais cette analyse, qui met en valeur la réalité par le but ici, donc on veut dire, d'achever la réalité de cause, condition ultime de la science 
Elle n'a plus pas directement, ce qu'on a mis du temps, qui se limite au mouvement de mon antérieur et postérieur, en insistant sur le statut de l'instant, et sur le monsieur qui dit que la translation s'est ouverte. Or, et c'est un peu ça ma tête, hein, je tiens à souligner ici que, contrairement à une opinion courante, cette analyse du temps n'épuise pas la conception à l'histoire du temps, qui ouvre à une autre analyse du temps. Tout ça a envisagé la création des phénomènes du complet. Vous comprenez pourquoi j'ai fait un rapport avec la critique moderne de ce livre. Cependant, cette autre analyse n'est pas clairement climatisée si ce n'est dans l'ordre de l'action, de dans la praxis, à travers la notion de Kairos, le temps propice, le temps propice. Mais nous voulons considérer également les processus biologiques et la génération spontanée qui reflètent l'émergence d'un être et d'un temps selon un moment non favorable, un moment favorable, un temps propice. Et pour cette fondamentalement en tant que créateur. Dans le traité de la génération de l'animal, un point de voir, où il pose pour thèse qu'il est meilleur d'être plutôt que de ne pas être, de vivre plutôt que de ne pas vivre, Aristote déclare que, je cite, la nature crée de la façon qui convient, une nouvelle vie et l'autre. A tel enseigne où, en comparant les différents niveaux de la vie et les différentes facultés, il précise que la sensation du boucher, hein, du boucher à vie, qui est pourtant ce par quoi se définit la vie, pour les étangs animés, pour les êtres animés, n'est presque rien si on la compare à la présence d'un projet. Tandis qu'elle apparaît comme ce qui est le cœur, si on la compare à l'insensibilité des étangs inanimés. On devrait être heureux de dire d'avoir ne serait-ce que cette connaissance par le boucher, plutôt que d'être mort ou de ne pas exister. Le propos fait voir qu'au-delà de la définition du temps lié à la transformation, il faudrait distinguer deux types de temporalité opposées. L'une est distinguée, correspondant au dépérissement, à l'effacement, à l'oublier. L'autre créatrice, relative à la jeunesse, à la progression et à la mémoire. C'est en partant de cette constatation qu'Aristote est appris dans le traité de l'âme qu'il existe deux formes de la présidentielle. L'une qui met en jeu la soirée de dépérissement par l'action du concept, l'autre qui applique une sauvegarde un salut, ce qu'il y a de vie. Et qui traduit, qui se traduit par une progression du virus, comme la connaissance ou l'action. Et l'on voit au risque du point qui est de la nature qui dit à ça existe et qui Donc le texte est capital parce que nous, les auteurs possédés, il y a un cible, toute une temporalité progressive de l'action progressive. La temporalité progressive d'une progression est liée à la liberté et à la fin, comme ceux qui les cœurs, et implique une flèche du temps opposée à celle du temps qui s'agit. Il n'est donc pas difficile de distinguer que les dix textes cherchent également, c'est là que ça ne pas toujours vraiment le temps, cherchent également à dépasser le temps physique, qui n'explique vraiment que le temps extatique conduisant à la mort. Et là suit un autre type de temps qui, à travers la convergence, vise la date de bonheur. Ainsi, l'intérêt de la méthode pionnier dans la recherche de la science du temps a, je dirais plutôt, et la science a l'intérêt historique. Un Aristote pionnier dans la recherche de la scientifique du temps s'ajoute à un Aristote pionnier dans la réflexion d'un temps associé à l'avènement unique et contingent régi par la préexistence de plusieurs facteurs en même temps. Autrement dit, Aristote ignore fondamentalement parce qu'il cherche à établir pour la première fois dans la pensée humaine une science unique et donc une approche scientifique du temps. Or, pour y arriver, non seulement il réussit le constat à la réalité de devenir et à l'ordre aussi que de devenir plus sensible. C'est ce que j'ai défendu autrefois, je l'en ajoute. Mais il réussit à faire aussi prévoir, prévoir une temporalité irréductible à la science de l'État, qui possède, nous le devons, le temps pour vivre de Kairos, ce qui m'oblige à faire ici une clarification et à constituer la question grecque du temps. Nous voulons donner la tâche facile. Je vous mets un petit accord. Avec une théorie du 
qu'on met non seulement sur le temps de Colosse, mais aussi sur le temps de vie ailleurs, et le temps pour risque ailleurs. La pensée de Platon jette un peu de lumière sur cette histoire du temps, parce qu'elle considère que le temps de Colosse est l'image de l'éternité, plus exactement l'image mobile de l'éternité immobile, c'est-à-dire l'ailleurs. C'est Dans sa pensée, le texte Léon est ambigu. Car tantôt, il prend le temps à peine de penser. Donc le temps à peine, c'est bien pensé. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire à penser Ça veut dire que chaque chose a son temps propre. Ici, nous ne le serons encore 40 minutes. Ça veut dire qu'on a un temps de vie de 40 minutes. Dans le milieu, on a le mois au sein de sa tête. C'est le temps. Chaque chose a un temps de Chaque chose a un temps de Ça, c'est le thème originel. Originel, ça fait de l'ailleurs. Donc il, il maintient ce sens dans le bien. Et tantôt, il est temps, ce temps de vie, dans l'ordre de ceux qui ne sait jamais, dans ce temps de vie qui ne sait jamais. Et cela, il occupe déjà la problématique de cette vidéo. C'est la première fois que la problématique de quelque chose qui existe toujours. Mais la véritable automatisation de la problématique de l'éternité, on la trouve chez Thomas, de beaucoup plus tard. Du côté à fait, le rapport entre Cronos et Athéon. Et au cœur de la pensée de l'action et de la clé. Et dans un sens, un verset de celui qu'on reconnaît à la suite à cause de Platon. Renan, qui est plus fondamental, est plus continu que ailleurs. Il signifie le temps de vie des choses éternelles, qui sont chaque fois dans le présent, c'est-à-dire, j'assiste les théorèmes. Bon, je crois qu'après le termine dans les études dans les il ne faut pas confondre, comme on était généralement, c'est pas du point universel, l'expression à peine et on a, qui signifie des choses qui sont dans le présent, qui donne une illumination temporelle, et l'expression en a, qui signifie des choses qui sont. La stabilisation des choses selon le mode de l'état de l'être ne s'impose qu'à la fin de la philosophie de Socratique, notamment avec le jeune d'Apollonie, pionnier d'une interrogation concernant sa fondation. C'est le premier qui utilise vraiment le terme de Constata Honda. Amplifié par la réflexion platonicienne d'Orphan d'Ospol et par Aristote dans l'expression d'Orphan et Orphan, les gens en tant qu'étant. Mais bien avant ces différentes tentatives de stabilisation qui conduisent à la science, les choses qui sont dans le présent, ça et en cas, sont associées à une conception du temps exprimée par le terme de temps de vie et Orphan. Or, si, s'il nous est difficile aujourd'hui, d'appréhender la notion originelle d'Eon. C'est parce que la philosophie est faite à filmer depuis Platon un retournement spectaculaire de cette notion en nous conférant le sens de l'éternité. Avec Aristote, les choses qui existent, pour lui, il est même de l'éternel, et sa partie supraguelaire des temps d'un homme, matériellement fondée sur un corps parfait et tel, qui par sa nature produit un mouvement de tentation circulaire dans la nature, où le temps est aboli au profit de l'éternité ailleurs. Dans son traité des siècles, il considère que les états du monde supraterre ne sont pas sujets de vieillesse, sur les faits du temps, dans l'ordre, mais sont au contraire inaltérables, préimpassibles, et jouissent de la vie, oui, la meilleure et la plus audacieuse, qu'ils accomplissent dans la plénitude de leur temps de vie propre dans la barre et en l'âme. Mais si Aristote s'occupe peu, dans le reste de son œuvre, la question de l'Éon, cette dualité de temps qu'on fasse fort avec la science contemporaine. D'une part, il y a le temps qu'on tente de de chaque être, pour mettre en l'occurrence en tant que vie sans fin de figure dans le monde des débilités. Et d'autre part, il y a un temps pour nous qui concerne le monde du univers de la convergence. Tout se passe comme si la théorie de la réversibilité du temps appartenait à l'Aïon, tandis que celle de l'irréversibilité au Cronos. Or, les études actuelles sur la pensée grecque révèlent un usage courant de trois termes types de temps. Le temps Cronos, le Kairos, donc c'est un temps travail qui se fait actuellement, surtout dans le monde francophone. Il y a eu beaucoup de colloques et beaucoup de, 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 de textes actuellement pour ce qui est le Kairos, un emploi de ce qui est le il existe en effet un temps pour Kairos qui signifie un lieu propice. Et non pas seulement le temps propice, un lieu propice. Comme par exemple, ce lieu du corps, car il y a la fatale flèche. Donc au fond, la mort la subite, la mort de la tête, c'est que le soir, la flèche au cœur, hein, c'est un lieu propice du cœur. 
Cela n'est pas la dépendance d'un corps pour tous, puisque pour la tête, par exemple, un poisson en vol, il faut non seulement organiser le lieu pour par exemple, le cœur, mais également le faire au moment où il convient le mieux. Le temps pour tous, le moment où il convient le mieux. Ce caractère se passe au temporel de la notion de Kairos. Le fait que ceux qui distinguent le Kairos, le Kairos et le Lairon, c'est qu'il tient compte de la problématique de ce qui convient le mieux. Pour réaliser quelque chose, c'est-à-dire qu'il tient compte de ce qui se doit, les meilleures conditions pour faire appeler quelque chose de unique. C'est quelque chose de unique. Or, on croit le plus souvent que la notion de temps pour lui, elle est surtout utilisée par le service, dans le résumé de la réalisation. Il est certain que la réalisation le cas ce type de temps pour la vie. Mais on sait maintenant que Platon a prolongé cette perspective dans le domaine de l'action. Et récemment, j'ai compris quand même, et donc ça c'est des études, malheureusement, qui ne sont pas encore publiées, qui sont plus que d'autre part, que d'une part, toute la philosophie de l'action de l'État fait usage de ce type de temporalité, et d'autre part, que Plotin va encore plus loin et objecter cette notion en la considérant comme exprimant le temps propre au fondement à l'âme. Au point que Procos, un des derniers néo-catholiciens, du 5e siècle, se permet d'indiquer que selon certains penseurs, le temps, le temps concerne les trois plans du réel, les trois plans du réel, le monde sensible de l'âme et les chiffres par le temps au sens de Kronos. Le monde intelligible de l'intelligence passe par Kronos et l'homme passe par Kronos. C'est important parce que c'est le fondement qui est fondé sur Kronos et pas sur Kronos. Pour comprendre la spécificité de ce temps pour lui. Il faut rappeler que dans le politique, Platon propose deux métiers, pas de deux métiers. La première concerne l'ordre du jugement et des structures mathématiques. L'autre se réfère à la chute de Dieu sur l'être, à ceux qui se voient sur l'être, à ceux qui égoïsent sur l'être et à ceux qui proviennent de l'être. Vous voyez le lien de toutes ces notions importantes au l'être, au l'être, au l'être, au l'être. Toujours dans le politique, il révèle qu'il existe aussi une science. La science politique qui commence aux puissances du droit marché car elle connaît quels sont les moments favorables ou défavorables considérés pour s'élancer dans les grands projets. Il est à peine utile de souligner que ces moments compris pour émerger une action unique dans un acte de temps privilégié, en lui-même unique, qui ne peut être répété de la même façon à un autre moment, mais qui, pour émerger, requiert des multiples conditions. Alexandre le voit mieux dans son histoire et de cite ces différents circuits du temps en commençant à situer le temps au sens de Kronos, dans l'ordre de la première réalité, alors qu'il a fondé le concept scientifique du temps. C'est dans ce contexte scientifique qu'il récupère également le temps au sens de l'homme, qui sert via sa conception cosmologique du réalisme. Quant au Kairos, il le situe dans la seconde réalité, celle qui fait état de la chute de Dieu et qui intègre de sa part dans le domaine de l'activité et des activités d'action. Par là, il prononce le point de vue sophistique qui situe le temps pour lui sur Kairos dans le discours et le prononce en même temps le point de vue Platon. Lorsqu'il fait état au début de l'éthique électorale, de nos diverses activités en liant les liens à la finalité, pour montrer qu'il existe une fin de vie des activités, il dit ceci N'est-il pas parfait que vous la de la vie la connaissance de tout bien est un grand point, et que l'on a des archers qui ont une cible sous les yeux, nous voulons plus aisément atteindre le but qui convient pour les autres. L'expression c'est ce qui convient, qui rejoint le langage de Platon, est une grande importance et décide de une problématique de l'action qui suit, pour Aristote, le cesse d'utiliser cette expression. Tout est dit qu'elle est normale, c'est toujours fondé sur le soleil, le vide et le verre. Mais il y a plus. Car le bien n'est plus le bien commun des transcendants de Platon. Puisque, dit Aristote, le bien s'applique d'autant de façon que l'être, je vous appelle l'esprit du bien. Car il se dit, dans le sien, par exemple, Dieu ou la clé, dans la qualité comme les vêtements, dans la quantité comme la chose de Dieu, dans la relation communique, dans le temps qui est comme le temps pour les êtres de l'homme, dans le Dieu comme l'habitat, et ainsi de suite, il est clair qu'il ne serait être quelque chose de commun, de général, de bien, car s'il était, il ne s'intégrerait pas de toutes les catégories de l'une seule. Et là, il a dit aussi qu'il est capital. De plus, les biens sont l'objet d'une multiplicité de sciences. 
Même ceux qui tournent sur une seule catégorie, ainsi pour les pas pour les catégories, dans la guerre, il y a la stratégie. Vous avez compris, dans la guerre, il y a la stratégie, les stratèges doivent calculer le moment où on puisse pour attaquer, c'est la guerre. Dans la maladie, il y a le médecin. Le médecin doit savoir à quel moment il doit guérir. Dans les exercices, pas de grand, la gymnastique. Le texte est important, vous l'avez compris, car il est révèle. En dehors de la science physique, lorsque quelque chose est produit, le temps conserve la création et le temps de se mettre du grand police. En prononçant cette perspective, on peut se mettre le temps propice également dans l'action. Au livre de l'éthique de l'Irak, Aristote le dit que les études éthiques, comme les métiers au moyen de la ressource, sont sujets à mérir par excès ou par manque. Comme le point de dans le cas de vue de la vigueur corporelle et de la santé, car l'excès et l'insuffisance des précis font perdre également la vigueur. Par exemple, dans le point de manger, une trop forte ou une trop faible quantité détruit la santé, tandis que la juste de la copie, la croix, la conserve. Quant à la vérité et la rapport avec les affections et les actions, en tiers, on les fait des excès, des faux et moyens, ainsi dans la crainte, la colère, la pitié, et en général, dans tous les sentiments de plaisir et de peine, on rencontre du sort du fondeur, lesquels ne sont bons ni l'un ni l'autre. Au contraire, le sort est ce qui est le sort, au moment qu'on puisse ôter vie, éveil, dans le cas des crises, à l'égard des personnes qui conviennent, le souci, pour des raisons et de la façon qu'il faut ou bien le cas, c'est à la fois la tâche de milieu et la tâche dans le silence, caractère qui appartient à la réalité. Si l'on s'agit de ces éléments à la politique, nous constituons l'action régulée en fonction de la bonne délibération. Et la notion de délibération est fondamentale pour le temps pour les de la bonne délibération. La bonne délibération est une certaine effectivité, pas n'importe laquelle, cependant, mais celle qui vise à faire le lien à la vie des filles. Pour bien les on peut atteindre le lien en beaucoup de temps, tandis que d'autres réussissent à atteindre en peu de temps. Pourtant. Donc, dans le domaine de l'action de la progressive, il faut bien réaliser l'action dans les meilleures conditions possibles, c'est-à-dire selon les conditions possibles. Par conséquent, la voie par laquelle on atteint ce qui convient, car il vous dit, ouais, une fois où la voie de libération conduit à une activité qui est utile au vêtement, parce qu'elle contribue à réaliser la fin, il est à tasse de nos efforts pour ce vêtement. Parce qu'elle porte sur ce qui convient, c'est-à-dire la fin de la vie, pour dire, Selon la manière qui convient, hostile. Et au moment qui convient, obtenir, c'est-à-dire au moment qui convient. Lorsqu'on tient compte de tous ces éléments, on comprend que la progressive va régler la disposition dans les meilleures conditions possibles. Selon le contexte qui est défini, la temporalité La temporalité qui est en œuvre n'a plus grand-chose à voir avec la temporalité physique, telle qu'elle est établie en physique. L'implication de plusieurs facteurs en même temps, en action, lequel une autre note vive de temporalité. Celui-ci suit une autre, une autre nécessité qui faut faire à l'action d'une dimension qui est propre et qui est une dimension de créativité. Cette temporalité, pour bien le voir, concerne effectivement les âges. C'est ça qui est important. Non, d'abord, ce qui implique, c'est ce, ce qui implique cette libération, comme celle de sa paix, du pilote ou du médecin. Mais elle est, me semble-t-il, et là, je crois une euh, option, transposable aussi à la durée de la génération spontanée, où ceux qui s'enchantent spontanément s'accomplissent non pas par une cause qui s'en est faite, mais par l'action de l'environnement, qui adopte des conditions matérielles de cette action et des conditions de chaleur, et non pas par une cause directe et puissante. Ce sont les meilleures conditions et l'hyper proposant qui font émerger une organisation dans un grand contexte. Nous avions ici, et je t'ai dit la rue, le point de départ pour le sujet, où j'ai montré pourquoi la science contemporaine est parvenue à créer pour tout et tout, à retrouver la terre du temps selon les conditions nouvelles offertes par les structures dissipatives et d'autres facteurs, rendant effectivement la notion même de terre du temps. S'il apparaît plus clairement maintenant, en quoi la théorie actuelle, telle qu'elle est l'institut de la science, n'est pas ça construire ces structures auto-organisatrices. La question du point de l'horizon de cette communication est celle de savoir si cette difficulté n'est pas tributaire des limites de la méthodique utilisée jusqu'ici dans notre pratique du temps. 
La pensée de la vie peut être contribuée à penser un autre type de temps, grâce à la notion de Taylor. La question est ouverte. Le dilemme de la question est supposé et la lumière. Plus qu'à ça, le fait d'état de Taylor est pour les activités humaines. En réponse, les recherches de Taylor à partir de Taylor vont permettre d'établir une application plus générale de ce temps, que j'ai appelé temps immunologique, parce que je pensais cela en immunologie. Parce qu'il possède non seulement là, mais également une échange de choses publiques. J'ai montré que le temps immunologique est un temps qui ne se réduit ni au hasard, ni à la nécessité. Mais je sais les deux pour faire apparaître ce qui convient pour qu'une chose soit réalisée. Il faut comprendre l'association entre ce qui se doit au verbe et le temps pour plus. Taylor, donc signifiant que l'avènement d'une chose qui est bon et faute d'argent, sans pour autant qu'il soit conforme ni au hasard, ni à une nécessité de trouver. Entre la nécessité de hasard, il existe bien une fois de possibilité, à savoir celle où le hasard est maîtrisé par des conditions qui se donnent en obligatoire, non pas toujours et en toutes circonstances, mais dans un contexte déterminé, grâce auquel une chose régulière peut appeler selon ce qui est en propre. Je vous donnerai des cas, je sais que euh, vous convaincra, et parce que j'ai beaucoup réfléchi cet exemple. Lorsqu'on se trouve au printemps, dans la campagne, et on observe la confusion des plantes qui adviennent dans les pays sauvages, c'est-à-dire non soumises à la technologie et à la pharmacologie humaine. On constate que ces plantes adviennent non seulement parce que les conditions climatiques et les cycles de la nature ont permis, comme par le sol de nécessité naturelle, avec aussi il y a une nécessité naturelle, mais aussi parce que l'action des plantes, l'action de la sec, la rendu possible, possible. Selon un hasard, un prévisible et acceptable. Ce qui a rendu possible chez hasard, c'est le dépôt de semences en lieu précis que rien ne peut déterminer. C'est bien cette conjonction entre les problèmes de la nature et du hasard propre au contexte contingent qui fait atteindre et parmi les plantes comme de ce soir, grâce à la constitution génétique, mais en même temps que rien ne peut déterminer. Le lieu propice et le temps propice forment en l'occurrence un espace-temps bien particulier et demande d'être circonscrit. Le record génétique propre à chaque corps concret, que soit qualifié de réponse finale, ou d'informatique ou d'information génétique pour aujourd'hui, rencontre en l'occurrence une conjonction de circonstances et de conditions. Des conditions des meilleures pour les données qui se rassemblant forment une sorte de logos de la nature. Le fruit de chaque chose qui advient, ce logos n'a rien de mal, mais constitue des modes qui rassemblent les conditions nécessaires suffisantes pour produire une confusion de plantes radiales à tel lieu et à des moments propices. Le reste est nullement nécessaire de raconter un tel logos à un tel mot lieu, immanent, comme le mot historien, et tous les pandémies, ou transcendant, acte même de multiplication unité, comme le mot idéologien, qui soutient la création de l'émanation. Franchir le bas de l'obstitulation, selon un point du vin tel que soit, constitue un acte qui a priori de l'œuvre problématique et imposée, voire incontable. En revanche, on peut se contenter de constater le phénomène par une approche descriptive, selon le mot d'une confusion qui s'auto-organise selon tout ce qui se voit. Ce type d'éducation qui rend possible la confusion des choses et des événements, en l'occurrence des plans, selon un ordre propice, permet d'établir une approche énologique et non théologique des phénomènes, ou un type de temporalité des propre. Ce temps qui est propre à la conjonction des phénomènes, au rassemblement des sciences sales, n'est pas effectif en tant que vie au sens traditionnel du terme. Il constitue le propre du temps propice et correspond au temps propre de ce qui est bien comme il se doit, dans l'occurrence du temps, parce qu'il se trouve selon les meilleures conditions pour qu'il advienne. Ce qui serait là aussi, si les semences se posaient par exemple sur des routes asphaltées ou sur un sol aride. Ce temps est en quelque sorte observable et manifeste quelque chose de l'expérience de la manière du temps. Rapporté au groupe des particules, de notre organisation qui manifestement se produit au-delà de la salle de la nécessité, ne pourrait-il pas contribuer à mieux comprendre la question critique du temps tel que se pose aujourd'hui en science C'est aussi en critique que le bien a donné une réponse à ces questions. Mais quelle que soit la théorie, il me semble clair que tel 
que les dice porque me encantó que tengo les dije por su nombre porque yo me he escrito en el nombre de mi nombre y en mi nombre y les dice et qui va les savoir, c'est le développement du sens de la physique, et en particulier la licence de la théorie du chaos. Nous permet de comprendre comment les lois coexistent avec la dimension physique de la nature, et comment la séance de la vie des deux mots, hasard et nécessité, est indispensable à l'intensité et la climatabilité du monde. Si l'on tient compte de la nature du temps, tel que je viens de proposer, c'est bien cette présence simultanée du hasard et de la nécessité que la notion de Kéros prend aussi. Cela seul rend peut-être pertinent qu'on le trouve à l'histoire pour penser le sens de l'électricité du temps. Je vous remercie. Les seuls qui font la différence dans la physique, surtout, entre ceux qui sont subjectifs 
Il n'y a pas de chose de continuer la guerre consécutive. Et ça veut dire qu'il n'y a pas de consécutif, ce qui est consécutif, ça ne va pas continuer. Et ce qui est ce que est donc il fait un ensemble de précisions dont la communauté n'a pas fait un partage. Mais si la communauté prend le dessus, c'est ça le paradoxe, ça aurait pu être l'inverse. C'est-à-dire que ça aurait pu être la discontinuité. C'est parce qu'il s'attaque à mort et à un dictatorisme. C'est la question du pays. C'est un problème du pays. Donc ça se fait en question. C'est pourquoi il faut que le but qui est le principe de discontinuité. Donc il faut tout en débarrasser parce que l'origine de cette histoire commence avec la structure du symbolique du monde qui était fondée sur des noms. Et les noms n'ont pas de continuité et sont discontinués de cette façon. C'est ça qui a provoqué tous les problèmes de base de des noms et ainsi de suite. Donc c'est un ennemi et c'est ce que je Donc il peut de trouver les fondements de continuité en dépit du fait de structure de discontinuité du point de connaître et qui analyse. Et c'est pour cela que finalement ça a commencé par nous rapporter peu à peu vers le monde supérieur dans la continuité des années. C'est-à-dire la continuité devient la mesure suprême, la mesure pour tout ce qui est au mouvement. Donc c est, c est ça, les quatre modes d'unité sont d'abord la continuité. Ça veut pas dire que les choses se rejettent, non, mais ils sont toujours sur bon. C'est la continuité du mouvement céleste de premier. Donc ça veut dire que ce qui est consécutif est toujours sur ce bon. Dans le monde de l'air, le chose consécutif n'a pas été rapporté à la continuité. Donc la mesure est toujours la continuité. Comme par exemple dans la couleur, il faut rapporter ces couleurs au blanc. Dans le noir, la création. Deuxième type d'unité, c'est le tout négatif. Par exemple, si, si je prends mon plan, je suis constitué d'un gars, je suis constitué d'un monomère, d'un monomère, donc la structure d'unité là, le tout de la continuité, c'est le tout négatif. Si je prends l'exposé de M. Tiffman tout à l'heure, et il a rappelé justement la question de, de l'intérêt, à ce moment-là, pour l'instant, le tout d'unité, c'est la question de, de l'engagement, la question de l'unité au niveau du monde, hein, c'est la question de l'unité. On a un autre type de mesure d'unité. Et enfin, le quatrième qui est le plus complexe, et il y a des unités par l'individualité, c'est l'individuel, il y a l'espèce humaine, il y a le genre, il y a l'analogie. Donc c'est ces quatre types d'unité qui fait, qui régissent toute la documentation de l'histoire. Donc finalement, la première réponse est de ça, hein, si vous avez une communauté sur le côté solide, on peut le passer, en même temps, parce que c'est un comme Dieu supère la continuité, dans la continuité supère, c'est Dieu pour penser de la pensée. Dieu pour penser de la pensée. Qui est le principe de l'état de la donc le premier moteur de toute la continuité de mouvement dans la nature. Donc là, c'est son peu de la continuité. Donc c'est parce soit les formes, les textes ont pensé aussi la baisse. C'est pas que la baisse, c'est que je l'ai montré, les écoles ont pensé exactement la baisse. C'est la discontinuité de mouvement des choses. La discontinuité de la chose. Donc, les, je dirais que l'idée que tout ça, comme je peux expliquer un peu la technique, c'est un mix entre Aristote et tout ça, et les pensées qu'on a à l'accentuar, et c'est de l'évolution. On ne peut pas fonctionner ni sur l'accentuar seul, ni sur la même chose. Donc, à la même chose. Thank you. 
The process of passes from potential to the actual is not a biological one. It is the expression of the internal dynamics of matter. Consequently, it is possible to recuperate the category of potential as expressing the internal possibilities of matter, except in the case of the logical process. Second part, classical mechanics, the notion of identity. Physics can tell the American American Newton trying to convey the true laws of nature. In fact, this is what makes the laws of the kind of motion from the unit of part of motion from the magnitude plane of the mechanical process. It is true that the car formulated the principle of conservation of motion energy. Yet, the French philosopher, now Gordon, who gave the necessary quantity of motion to the nature and who possesses it by its condition. Newton, in his time, and in spite of his dialectical intuitions, associated matter with motion. Matter was identified by the field of universal mass, and then the change of this stage was considered as the result of the process external to matter. The association of matter and energy has been completed with the advent of thermodynamics. Mass matter was now considered as a net dimension. While energy was buried as a material substance, caused of no matter change. Change in the field of classical mechanics means change from the velocity or restructuration of the other atoms. The dialectics between potential and the alpha is incompatible with the mechanistic paradigm. Let us make more complete this assertion by taking into account the formal master of the world. As is well known, the state of the classical system is defined by the values of the coordinates of the position and the values of the three components of this momentum. In the frame of classical and classical idealizations, it is accepted that it is possible to measure exactly the six variables to find the state of the object, but it is possible to find this position in the first space. The compatibility of the variable to find the classical state appears the magnitude of the distributed law. The validity of the distributed law means in this term that the values of the ensemble of positions concerning the classical system is true. Yet, as is well known, the Boolean logic is a formal logic, the logic of identity. During the measurement of the model in space, the system conserves its identity. From this point of view, also, are excluded from the real of mechanics, the process of quality, and calculate the change of the master of the the knowledge of the six varieties of the time in the classical state of the other data that means to predict its deterministic moment in space. From the logical point of view, the necessary condition for that deterministic theory is that this logic is Boolean. However, this is not a sufficient condition. The necessary sufficient condition for a Boolean system with a high time increase of freedom to be deterministic is the atomicity of the propositions concerning the system. All the atomicity of the proposition means that the system concerns its identity through the measurement. From this point of view, also, the contradiction between the aristocratic dialectics and the mechanistic paradigm becomes obvious. Now, it is time to pass the probabilistic and microphysical theories in order to bring to life the concrete relation between the potential and the action. The third mass matter and energy in the dialectics between the potential and the abstract. The electromagnetic theory of action, the big integration, the extraction of material waves, was in the city of the value of the mechanistic part. However, it was with the special value that the concrete specific content of the categories of the potential and the abstract was, for the first time, brought to life. The passage from the homological categories to the corresponding concepts became now possible. Philosophy has said that the good deed is extremely positive in the abstract and it comes back to the concrete. The dialectic between the potential and the actual concerns the real, mainly in the case of relativity, the relation between mass, matter, and energy. Newton gave the whole definition of matter. It is the quantity that I mean that we are after everywhere under the name of all the formats. The quantity of matter is computed from its density and part of conjoint. The circularity of the definition of this energy. Beyond circularity, the definition of Newton 
and the fact that it's that the question of what is it so illogical. In fact, what is it so illogical and definitely? It is not impossible. It would be possible to find matter as a very good existence in the definitely of the known subject. What that relation of matter does not exist for physics. There is no information contained in this world and the field of three there is no measure of matter. In a general sense, the matter for the physicist is the object of his investigations. Mass and energy and quantity are quite defined concepts. They correspond to opposite and again the separate matter of matter. Inertia and emotion. In spite of that, the identification of the fashion of matter has been considered as a self evident With the combination of the concept of the analysis, the concept of tendency enters into the realm of physics. However, when the analysis follows the important tradition to define the mass of matter, and this energy has been considered as the energy as a substance, a prior form of mass. Physical reality was divided into two substances, mass matter and material energy. The two laws of conservation, the law of conservation of matter and the law of conservation of energy, were conveyed to the basis of this economy. However, the famous equation of my style, energy equal mass multiplied by the square of the velocity of light, expressed a hidden relation between mass and energy. How this equation was interpreted? Special activities of matter will be the international economy of the U.S. In spite of this factor, the relation between mass and energy has been interpreted in accordance with the economic value. The equation of Einstein establishes a complicated relation between two different physical factors, the mass and the energy. However, this relation was interpreted as a relation of identity. And since, following the economic tradition, the mass is identified with matter. The so-called mass matter was the defined of energy. A new monist was the opposite, the monist of energy. Let us call now, call now Einstein. The special theory of relativity has led to the conclusion that the earth mass is nothing more or less than energy, which finds its complete mathematical expression in a symmetrical measure of second time in energy measure. The first part of the precipitation is the utility of the pre-relativist interpretation. The second group opens in the way of the general relativist interpretation of the relation between mass and energy. Yet for this, besides the form and symmetrical formalism, we need the concepts of the potential of the action. Relativity is compatible with the international economic way. The relativistic quantities are expressed in the frame of the whole dimensional universe of the universe by whole vectors and vessels of second time. Mass and energy are different quantities and yet related by the equation of Einstein. Their unit is expressed by the fact that they, are, they correspond to the components of the energy in the right vessel. Mass corresponds to the free space components of the whole vector, while energy corresponds to its time component. Mass and energy separate the data and relative quantities. The variant quantity of the four dimensional formulas is the rest mass of the power. The momentum of energy tensor expresses the unity and at the same time the difference between mass and energy. It is not an expression of, expression of the data. The rest of mass is taken sometimes as the measure of matter. According to the point of view of the end of the year, this assessment has no meaning. The length of the energy momentum that vector is not the measure of matter. So it is not the height of matter, and energy is not the substance. The four vector is the geometric representation of the mutual variation of each space and time component that is of the relativity of the fast of the energy. If we have composed the four vector into two subspaces, the two dimensional space and the unidimensional time. In the frame of relativity, massive particles can be transformed into non massive ones. An electron can be positive in R, for example, transformed into a form. The first part of transformation is possible. How to interpret these transformations? In the pre-relativistic conceptual frame, the first is considered as a dematerialization of matter, the second as a materialization of energy. 
However, a general interpretation is possible. Mass is the measure of energy. It is not the measure of time. Energy is the measure of force. It is not the substance. The transformation of an electronic force into a photon is not a demagogization of matter. It is the transformation of two massive particles into a particle of zero less than mass. Corresponding, the transformation of the photon into a full of electric positron is not a materialization of the energy. It is about the transformation of a particle of zero less than mass into a full of massive particles. More generally, it is not easy to take from the electricity point of view to consider the massive particles, the electric value, the message, etc., as material, and the values of zero less than mass photons and graphics in the physics system uh, as a material. In the framework of relativity, it is possible to arrive, to arrive at a unique and enormous conception of power to demonstrate the only unit of the classical particles without using any substances, material or human material. For this, it is necessary to use the concepts of the potential and the actual and then the method of relations. In fact, during the transformation of the massive particles into non-massive ones, the actual mass becomes potential, while potential energy becomes actual. In the case of transformation of non-massive particles into massive ones, the actual energy becomes potential, while the potential mass is actualized. We can define the total mass of the public as the sum of its actual and its potential mass, the same force for, for its total energy. Consequently, on the basis of the predictive relations, it is possible to reformulate the question of conservation as distinct and at the same time correlated to the present. First, present conservation of mass. The sum of the actual and the potential mass of the public is conserved during all transformations. Two, principle of conservation of energy. The sum of the actual and potential energy is conserved during all transformations. During the transformations of the material particles, mass is not transformed into energy and vice versa because mass and energy are not substances. The principle of conservation of mass has nothing to do with the so called principle of conservation of matter. The first is a general law of matter, at least in the frame of our actual knowledge. The second is an ontological principle, impossible to verify or to classify. The proposition of matter is unsurvivable and indestructible, it is neither true nor false. It is the virtual point. As already stressed, matter is not a scientific concept and consequently there is no measure of matter. Contrary to the fact that it is but what yet I in fact to prove the conservation of mass, not of the matter. Moreover, this proof is false from the relativistic point of view. This ignores today even the case of the particular practice. The only unit of this party with extremely diversified properties is manifested, manifested in the laws of their mutual transformation. Fermions are transformed into bosons and vice versa, massive particles into non massive ones, the fusion of particles and other particles produces other particles via different channels and so on. During these applications, the multiple potentialities of the elementary particles are manifested. The laws of conservation of the electronic and ionic number of electric charge, the total angular momentum, etc., manifested during these transformations, express the law of the character of the realization of the potentialities of the different micro particles. It would be possible to consider the sedimentary carrier particles. Carbons, on the contrary, are the most of works and fuels. Even the electrons are properly composite. The concept of electricity, consequently, is relative to the limit of the forms of the physical reality. The same holds for the stability of the carbons. A particle starts with low energies, becomes a start with high energies, and unfolds with other potentialities. The laws of conservation and selection rules open up the limit of these transformations and the disappearance of some elements of reality and the presence of others of potentiality to actuality. The compact and destructive to the critical Newtonian particles is an abstraction. Today we know not only the so-called real particles. The 
built their partners, for example, built for projects, participated in the processes of the exchange between the real partners. They are the agents of their mutual determination. The potential partners emerge as the framework condition for the fusion of other partners. Unlike in the initiation of the alliance forms that they have no any independent existence. The price partners for the other kind of forms, markets, landmarks, etc., exist in the period of the sport region and their properties are dependent by their endure. Finally, the post production of this time, where it will allow the mass of the partners if they exist, will be declared for the solution of crucial as all problems, as for example, the famous juicy expression. Fourth part, potential and realistic states in quantum mechanics. During the transformation of quantum particles, the quantum particles realize when the general appears a hectic figure of potentialities. From one initial state, they realize more than one alien state. The potentialities of the microscopic agenda and the corresponding statistical distribution are considered by a real school as the scene of hidden and random and normal processes. We will not have to discuss this problem. We will speak our approach to the little of the professional quantum mechanics. The quantum systems are described as we well know by the state vector. The evolution of the state vector in the case of the idea is relationally deterministic. If, on the contrary, we measure the entire factor of the system, we get in general case more than one major state. The square of the state vector will be represents the probability density. By integration, it is possible to compute the probability to find a market in a certain point of view of the area of space. In the case of a single position, C equals C minus C C, the square of the same gives the probability of the corresponding elements in C. In the classical case, the state will exist on the measure. The measure in the past does not disturb the state of the system. The validity of the distributed flow and the full instruction of the lattice of the position express as already broken the compatibility of the observers to find the state. In the quantum case, on the contrary, the measurement of the observer can track and tracks the system and makes a positive measurement of the cross gate observers. This fact is expressed in the non dual instruction of the lattice of the position concerning the quantum system. For the same reason, the distributed law is not valid in the form of the case. Now, the difference in a position of precedent that follows. Yet, what is the physical meaning of this precedent? It is true that the position of precedent is valid in a certain class of classical systems as well. Mechanical systems, sound waves, electromagnetic waves, etc. How is the crossing for both the distributed law and the position of precedent to be valid for the same system, for the same classical system? In the classical case, the state will exist on the measure. They are actual. Our statistical assumption is a mixture. In the quantum case, on the contrary, the state will not exist on the measure. They are potential states and they are realized via the interaction of the system with the measure of the house. Our initial assumption, consequently, was a pure state. For this, it is now transformed into a mixture. The non-validity of the distributed law, the non-dual structure of the propositions, and the non-validity of the logical identity are the consequence of the fact that during the measurement was of an extra nature, the quantum ensemble realizes its potentialities. Some elements of reality disappear and other parts of potentiality are tried. The outcome is the immediacy in which emerges from the crowd can. The equation of C plus C C is usually considered as expressed by the identity. It gives the impression that the states will exist, that they are in similar position, and that the role of the apparatus in the project will analyze something actually when they are in In that case, every single system ought to be in similar position. Consequently, the state vector represents the single system and not statistical side. Or, in that case, the market must be potentially present everywhere in the region where the state vector is not zero. And this is not an else to by the observation. Consequently, this interpretation presupposes an action at a distance, a non locality, in compatible with the implicit of the The paradox of Einstein is the predicate of the convenient situation. 
However, let us accept for the moment the same system interpretation. How we have to work back in this context with the groups and the lines, etc. The actual agreement of the government does not describe the issue of the standard of reduction is impossible. For that reason, the beneficies is to be developed at others. They tell you that in order to obtain the use of the best and the result of the interaction, the initial state ought to be already in use. However, in that case, the best of them is in use with other ones. Finally, the best of the casino is better in order to transform the initial real state into a mixture for the observer of the top of the line. Yet, the constant segment of the business is affected by the process of the best this solicitic solution leads to a solicitic logic which is rejected by many businesses. The cost of the solution is great, but it can be equal to zero. In fact, our observer will become part of the private system, and for that reason, we will lose its marginal cost of reduction. This sarcastic part of the system here predicted the paralysis of the single system interpretation that will correspond to the solution of the reduction of the so called wealth gap. Nevertheless, uh, there is a way out of this confusion. The state director does not describe the individual system. He describes the statistical result. The so called reduction of the wave packet is a reality, a transformation of the new elements of reality. It is a reversing, a dissipated process in the space of time and not an instantaneous process. This non-linear phenomenon is not described by the actual reality this point of knowledge was elevated to the status of mystery by the modern of school. Every study can be assisted, but we need a hereditary mechanics to describe transitions as real processes in space time and not as instantaneous jumps. The state vector is not a logistic artifice. It is the measure of the potentialities of the statistical assembly of human external conditions. Considering the human space in which the state vector belongs, it is not a space of actual or existing states. It is a potential space, but not a frame for the calculation of the probabilities of the possible tender states. The probabilities are the measure of the potentialities of the statistical assembly. The potential state is a pre-arising frame. First, the measure of the physical ensemble of which state space. Second, the measure of the apparatus of which state space. Big threat to the commission, the intersection between the two spaces has not been ended. The measurement of the is the system, where this function is not going to be used to the recording of the natural state. Nevertheless, first, the result is not incredible enough. The probabilistic distribution is in general credible enough. Second, the phenomenon is not a positive. The actualization of the potential states is due to the action of non physical interactions. Third, the phenomenon is not indeterminated. It obeys a statistical type of determination. The modification of the conditions appears the modification, the modification of the ensemble of the possible states or of their respective probabilities. During the actualization of the possible states, the new quantities do not arise out of nothing and the old ones do not disappear from nothing. They are transformed to something different and they can reappear under appropriate conditions. The mechanistic epistemology is unable to formulate the notion of potentiality in this conception of the I maintain that the probabilities are the numerical measure of the potentialities of the country statistical ensemble under the barrier of external conditions. Yet, what is the status of the probabilities in that case? So I have just read some of my text. Take away the classical case, they consider that the probabilities are objective and uh, that the dispersive state must, can be reduced into a non dispersive one. Because according to the Papaya interpretation, the quantum probabilities are non reducing to a non dispersive state. The efforts to formulate the theories of the variables try to incorporate total law in fact in a non fluid structure into a full network. I think that it is not necessary to have a total effect of the analysis in a classical one because we can have hidden variety of theories or a statistical measure. So, 
function of operation for the language of composition in the classical school. This show uh, the probability, the essential difference between the classical and the probability is that, that in the classical there will be always a visual actual state, although in the quantum one we have potential states that are realized and they give this or that probability is this division. So I just for Democrats, as well as for Newton, we need this action. If in space is a solid object for Newton, and the infinity of atoms constitute the physical reality. Space and time has a historical force for intuition of character, conformed with the mechanistic universe. Aristotle, on the contrary, rejected the fact, because in the vacuum the force is inevitable, or there is a fact that the force is more of the less preferential, since vacuum is such that there is no difference. Matter, Marston is continuous. The same goes for time. Instant is the beginning and the end of the time, not at the same time, but the end of the past and the beginning of the future. The concept of the deep is here and the world is facing the world. According to the deep, it is not a promise. It is in a state of recovery. This kind of ruin the world is a better rather than infinite, so as to reserve the same infinity to God alone. For contemporary physics, what is not the case of the infinity? It is not for me one of the molecules. What is considered as a medium and local to the physical properties, the reality is for what observable phenomena. Following the ideas of the life of Einstein, it is possible to consider the vacuum as an ocean of potential particles which can emerge from this different unit and pass the potentiality of the planet. Finally, actual physics seems to transcend the contradiction between the fields and the particles, between continuity and discontinuity. Modern field theories and modern cosmology conform with the actual general conception of a universe unfolding its potentialities in space and time. In fact, we know today that the forms of matter are not eternal, that during the evolution of the universe, new forms were created, the other disappeared. The hypothesis of the big planet was supposed to be physical ideas, several initial only, infinite ideas, and intellectual, etc. However, modern cosmology produced the idea of cosmogenesis. Matter and force of the scientists create new forms in its endless form. Even the basic of conservation of matter is good today to be tested. In fact, it is well known that the model of state 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 universe presupposes the creation of mass not out of time, but from the more profound and today observable legal organization. The dialectic between potential and action seems to be a general law of nature manifested in concrete and specific conditions. Isn't that interesting? Objective, 
Tim Martin and the OIF in recent law packages spelled out very precisely why that's the way they look at the problem and the way that they look at that. Now, if we look at the problem that way, and to, to make it concrete, the problem is made very sharp by phenomena which were anticipated by the Einstein and Mark in this book of the South of the quantum mechanics, but the existence was really only verified by the group of Bell's theorem, the sort of proof of the existence of non-local action. If standard uh, quantum mechanics is correct, and verified by the sort of aspect experiment. So imagine to make a concrete in one of these special cases, we have a correlated system, say of two particles. Think of each particle as having a little flag that the diamond put out and put out. So I call Oscar now. I can make an observation on Oscar. See whether the Oscar flag is up or down. Suppose I find that Oscar's flag is up. The name of the flag is spin, but or spin in a particular direction. I find that Oscar's flag is up. I know with certainty that if I look at Elmer's flag, Elmer's flag will be down. Question Was Elmer's flag already down? And Oscar's flag was already up before I looked. Is looking just finding out what's already the case? We like them in case that's the case, but unless you're really uh, willing to real violence with elementary combinatorics, it's all that it takes, elementary human logic, which is all it takes to be developed, that can be the case. So, here's another possibility. When I look at Elmer's flag, I reduce the wave pack. And Elmer's flag had an indeterminate position. You can take it in the light of the Let's go with that. It violated the law of the middle. It was somehow in a T state, which had both times left the flag up and flag down. Or you can use the flag of the potentiality and the flag of the potentiality of the flag up. 50% probability and potentiality that applied down to 50% probability of having a realized line of potentiality. But on either interpretation, when I look, after I look, Oscar's flag was definitely up. It wasn't in a mixture of both up and down, it wasn't only potentially up, it was up. It was actually up. Question. I don't know the certainty what Elmer's flag would be if I look. Is Elmer's flag does that mean that Elmer's flag is not definitely down? Only that it has potentiality down if I look. Further question, it's now definitely down. When did it start to be definitely down? The moment I look at Elmer, that notion makes no sense that I'm objective sign of the end. And so the theory will seem to be in trouble. Now, so we bring the question, a question from that, in that situation, which is sort of a simple situation, the idea of the technical name, the Einstein, but also the other situation. But the rest of the question keeps speaking about how very complicated it would feel with you. If you say that states are only attributes of the thing that the song is first, the states are only attributes of statistical ensembles, then what are these potentialities and potentialities of? The only potentiality that the measuring instruments, macroscopic measuring instruments, will look a certain way, as in the Popa Dick interpretation, the problem is that the Popa Dick decides that was like instrumentalism. If you're willing to go instrumentalist, what's the problem about interpreting quantum mechanics? If it's just interpreted as an instrument of predicting probabilities of measurement results, then we can do that, sure, but the problem is we like to think that these things have some properties which don't depend on human beings having good measuring instruments. And anyway, we like to think that human that the measuring instruments are just bigger, more complex, and closer to the more human beings to create. So that would be my question to the topic. So what are these potentialities, potentialities of, and can their realization be viewed as something which does not violate special relativity or requires some, some change in our understanding of general relativity. 
assumption, which was involved in mind, but just the next general discussion of the big leads to the objective side of the way. There are some proposals there to support the Guardian and the Labour interpretation, GRW interpretation, which holds that there is an objective, perhaps a way to die, a realization of the potential, and yes, it involves the existence of a simultaneity out there, but not one that we can measure. There are also interpretations, by the way, which deny that it's a class at all. The um, most popular now is called the equal coherence approach, and it's the full interpretation. On the other hand, if we say that there are these two things, first, I don't see why that requires more than two levels of reality, micro levels and a macro level. So that's our first question. And if one only has two, then it seems to me, for example, the three value logic interpretation by a teacher now, right? And not. So that would be my question. Whether, whether how the your interpretation of the logic of the form like you think it differs from the old micro model three value logic. Yes, uh, I'm not going to say it. Because the first stage is that it's a given assumption. And you see the assumption is that uh, uh, you have, in order to quotation mark, understand things, to interpret them at our level. Otherwise, it's going to be like thousands of things, something like that. A lot of things. It's a question of big letters, but why not? You make one hidden assumption that is very interesting because it's very automatic. And I think that it's a huge misunderstanding if you don't do those assumptions. And this is one thing I would like to say to you. There's absolutely no problem of understanding of these things you mentioned, for example, your flowers and so on. I don't think that. In mathematical world, in mathematical language, it's perfect. Set of system result of equations. But it has nothing to do with what you said, because it was a different language, the natural language, in which a lot of things are not defined. In the language of what we describe as delicate quality, we don't say that, but we describe as aspect experiment, which we did mention, and so on, non severity. The non severity is not existed. Now, where are the other instances when we come a couple of people who saw it? It's one of the little concepts. All the concepts were in one of the people who saw Everywhere. You see, and it's natural. Because we are the same for me. Because I'm speaking here, and the memory of the is not the same. The second question is also a little misunderstanding about three values of logics and value logics and logic of the human being. And of course, the thing is so funny that I try to explain. Uh, it's very simple when you make the formula of the table of inductions and it starts out there. But what you see in us is that the logic of the intuitive people is not a distinct value logic in the sense of only value. That is my clear answer. In the sense of it, that can be precise now. It's not a only value value. Because when we speak about multivariate objects, we speak about the modification of the second axiom of classical logic, which is the logic of the classical quantum logic, instead of having two that three the four. But they have In fact, if you look at the amount in all of the other instructions, all of that is the servers. Where is the computer? Where is the parallelism? It's a parallelism because it's not parallel. I'm saying this is what I'm saying. It's not the parallelism. It's not the parallelism. You have to have only one level. Yeah. If, if you have only one level of reality, sir, if you have only one level of reality, you can introduce multiple parallelisms. But can you keep the exclusive bit? Because they are what they call in mathematical language independent persons. You can modify one without modifying the other. Why? That you couldn't even modify the third. 
killing the, the second class. That modifies the second class of the way. Of course. Because the truth and false one now is defined not in, in two but in three terms and in the second time of the I 
why you don't lose the loss of life or very that you lose the loss of life. But when you do you, you spend the yeah. other part of the small part of the loss of your yeah. life, and the important for your second mechanics. But you cannot say that the common mechanics cannot violate the special because of the loss of the inside of the common mechanics that are classical. Yeah, I say it's like the question about violation of special activity is not a question about an experimental violation. All yes. of the interpretation, both global and the other uh, which oscillate at an objective side of the community, also predict that there will never be a yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Anyway, the point is not yeah. the same that the problem of the individual or the volcanic flow, no, inside the one of the guys. Because one can be so one can be so reckless. But inside, for example, the field, the field, even if you like the whole science, because one object, but not only one object, but, but also a special relativistic object. And this is a quality, a quality, you don't have to be special relativistic object. We should see if there's. Okay. I think that I must have a place in the other side. So you know, I want to do my approach, but I think that there is no other way to get rid of the Newtonian confusion that you call the natural in Corsian universe. In that case, mass and energy are not substances. They are the measure of the two contradictory attributes of matter. An electron in its precision has the totality of this mass as actual mass and the totality of this energy as potential energy. A photon, if you can speak of a system of the photon, has the totality of this energy as actual and the totality of this mass as potential. During the transformation, you have this uh, relativity of these two forms and concepts, but if you multiply, you can take a present energy or a present energy. That has to do with the physics that you share with the physics of conversion. In that case, the total of the mass and the total of the energy is invalid. And uh, during the moment of parking, you are in the presence of this useful transformation of the mass and the energy, of the potential and the action. I think that uh, this. Uh, uh, interpretation is in accordance with the constant for the national space. The other is the circularity. You know, the critical rights of life. I don't consider all this circular from the definition of view, but the conversion is totally the conception of space, such as space, as a term of time, etc. We are trying to respect relativity. Relativity is a theory corroborated of the time. I think okay, we'll be time to continue, but we have to take a break now. Okay. So we have to have another talk about the president. What's the question? I don't know. Stop. 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 As concerns the common point of these two uh, lectures, I don't know if the common point was the really about uh, the realistic or not the realistic point of view. Uh, the common point, according to my opinion, the discussion about uh, the openness of the universe in one case, openness uh, which concerns first uh, uh, in connection with the special uh, the, the knowledge process. And the shared elements of reality, which do not, uh, which cannot be closed uh, in a complete and clinical uh, sense. This was the point, and I think this was also the point of, from Professor Black, because Professor Black said also that matter is not a logical reality. Matter is not to be conceived as substance, it is rather to be conceived as mass and energy, and mass is the measure of inertia. Uh, energy is the uh, uh, measure of motion. For cosmic centuries, it is in this, in this respect uh, very important uh, that an interpretation of the microscopic reality must take into account the so-called problem of the, the problem of the so-called 
Jim Marekos. The Jim Marekos, uh, which would, according to the Soviet Union, if I understood him well, would solve the problem of the probabilities of the funding of the economic state, uh, of the economic system, uh, would be, in no case, the last answer to the question of what's matter. Because if the, if the question was what's the answer, then we would have a characterization of matter in a substantial way. We would be able to say matter is that of this. But Professor Rizakis, like uh, Professor Nicoletto, would like to avoid this. I guess the comment I think we have to stop uh, yeah, I just, very quick announcement, and then you can all go. Uh, first of all, um, all participants. Of universal propositions, all of which 
culture, due to the ultimate cooperation of the powers of our soul, from essences to noises. Yet the cooperation of these powers would have never produced a single instance of truth had it not been for the intelligibility of the world, of the excellent particulars and their inherent forms. For our small the world remains not only intelligible, but also very diverse, containing regularities as well as chance events, the former in determinate ways, the latter as possibilities. The features of the world interest us from the starting point of S species as elementary position to the highest step of the noises, a vision of the intelligibility's own structure as a system of processes where form, essence, and cause, or microconnected links between particulars and universals, including the highest object. Now we may ask, how is it that philosophy can perform such extraordinary tasks for a being, as Aristotle says, one of the two paths leading us out of the world? <coughs> I will not repeat and suppress what I have discussed in our publications, namely the argument concerning the unity of science. I will limit my remarks to the main points of our scholars' position. The thing that lurks in the background of this is if we are to speak of the unity of science, or rather of epistemic, we need to understand it from the concept of mental diversity. That is the special disciplines that study the general traits of the scene, its inherent features, including the soul's activities and violence. In addition to such sciences, what he called that and every philosophy, there is also part of philosophy of epistemic of our artist principles and universalities. There is also the concept of method as employed contextually in the age of the special memories as the method of particles of the uh, and other procedures of interscientific understanding. And this thing in this case constitutes the completion and the fulfillment of the purpose of human intelligence, provided it includes the principles that govern action and production. In effect, the strategic conception of the unity of the system is established by means of three central doctrines the theory of categories, the theory of principles, special and generic, and the ontology of the system. As a model of unity, it preserves the pluralistic conception of method, induction, deduction, and observation. Adjusted to the demands of the diversity of subject matters while preserving the continuity of the logical character of the special inquiry and that of the continuous of the unit. The same holds for the study of such subjects beyond the domain of physics, that is, ethics and politics and the arts. There is no difficulty in obtaining knowledge about performances and how it is added to that of the CD. Psychology provides the matrix for understanding the statements regarding action and creation. This is along these lines that we have continuity and unity of epistemic, effecting the articulations of the intelligibility of nature and in nature. As I hope to show, the cultural scope of Aristotle's unity of epistemic was a response to a broader set of intellectual problems and cultural needs than its counterpart in our century. I will not attempt a comparison between the two models at this point without undertaking first to discuss the ways of anti aristotelianism that is, the ways to determine the direction which the current attempts to construct the field of scientific unity model. The corresponding frameworks of the ancients and the modern are strikingly different. The modern attempts left the problem unresolved. It is still a burning issue. As 
a result of cultural policy in our times is still awaiting an alternative model. In this regard, I trust that I will not be out of line when at the end of my paper I will change the style from flippery points of position to a final advocacy. There is hardly a more anti Aristotelian position than Descartes' theory of innate ideas. In one stroke, he rejected both the Eustachian model of epistemic and the empirical origins of logical principles and categories. The British empiricists, on the other hand, fell short of restoring the certain useful Aristotelian elements related to their theory of sensation. They ended in a weakened type of reality. Locke and others came under the impact of skepticism, and ever since the appearance of human diversion of skepticism, what was left of the European tradition of realism was hardly worthy of the name. And it can be argued that the rejection of Aristotle's realism was a critical target for both empiricism and idealist theories of knowledge and continues down to the old times, especially in the works of the analytical type of Anglo American philosophy. Descartes is still the undisputed mentor and the fume of the writer of the native academician. In a sense, what has now come under the label of the philosophy of mind seems to have cultivated, whether overtly or overtly, an anti Aristotelian basis. It is virtually cut off from any connection that may assist in the reorganization and enrichment of its premises beyond soft name its critical status. It is questionable whether it can profit from our stuff to realism. What is even more surprising about Descartes and his heirs regarding the rejection of our thoughts theory of Epistemian logic is the pervasive inversion of the classical world. And let me explain it. Historically, there have been two patterns philosophers have followed in providing answers to the problem of everything else science, and both sorts of human patterns in the interrelationships of the established sciences. The assumption in both cases is that no matter how many different sciences are instituted, and regardless of their diversity, the sciences constitute a continuous and compatible set of cognitive creations. Both values intended to provide the grounds for showing how they were coming to work in the century often was what they call the bifurcation of nature. The first, the ethical of ontology. And it's been dominated by the model of his own father, Aristotle's realism. The second, that of the epistemology, was initiated by the art and further developed by Hume and Kant. My interest in bringing up this dual approach to the activity of science, despite what I have to understand of the contemporary trends that have led to the fragmentation of the human self on the one hand, and the debates of the gap between facts and values on the other. In other words, the concern is about the presence of discontinuities in the theoretical treatment of human experience. The strategy I found in this paper allows me to go back to Aristotle, expecting to find in his philosophy a model for a much needed revival of interest in the unity of a distinct problem. I've convinced the fresh, fresh examination of the daily discontinuities in the fabric of our culture, insofar as it's health depends on the involvement of the sciences, may lead to the removal of the disturbing elements. The preponderance of the literature on the unity of the scene shows that the way of epistemology has dominated the modern approach to this problem. Most, if not all, answers rested their case on an appeal to the premises of the time to remind us of current philosophies of mind. A consequence of the construed theory has been the rejection of Aristotle's model as false and untenable. 
reduction of the world resistance. An unavoidable degree of autonomy had to be recognized. But what became the only issue was the exclusion of a large area of the experience from their reductionist manipulation. The cultural dissonance that has fit into the unified model, since neither the concepts nor the generalizations have the logical structure of the physical and formal sciences. Experiment, experiment, maybe. But it brought to light more discontinuities than it cared to integrate. The initial complaint of the movement about, quote, ambiguity of discourse, and quote, did not serve its leaders well, but in criticizing the guilty model that is the language of traditional metaphysics, they swept away as useless the language of its materialism and the limited the referential efficacy of its formal logic. The new logic, symbolic logic, carried the day. Verification. Not the fact of sensation became the criterion to determine the meaning of a composition. If so, the Euclidean type of canonical propositions of fact of the empirical did not meet the positivist criteria. The immediacy of sense factors is true and fallen by the wayside along with what the modern times have become objectionable in metaphysics, ethics, politics, religion. And aesthetics as nonsense. Even the one mainstay of our jobs on how to two propositions, namely the faculty of the character form, the faculty of the judge, was systematically ignored, or rather not even suspected as a paradigm in the process of knowing. His ethics, like the rest of the nonsense disciplines, was relegated to the irrational side of the soul. It would not be an unfair criticism of the whole to say in retrospect that its unification program covered only a restricted area of science, namely the natural, biological, and only those of the social sciences that could meet the stringent criteria of verification. The came as most problems that it provided it proved impossible to dissociate the informative from the evocative uses of language, an admission that the British time to change the mind. Anyway, the unification of science failed. The problems, however, remain, along with a plethora of discontinuities our modern culture had generated. Together with those that modern philosophers have inadvertently compiled. Praise worthy as the attempt has been in its sincerity, not other movements before and after, logical and empiricism understood the seriousness of the persistent discontinuities and sought to remove them, at least upon the modern knowledge of fundamental and further progress. Pay the price of favor for its first anti The next generation, in the development of the analytical movement, with the new thinking time of its help, reshaped the explorations in the field of language and changed the scenery in an impressive, radical way, thus giving rise to another mode of stating the needed assumptions for a new philosophy of mind. It was expected that this term would provide would prove three of the sins of the older empirical views. Turn to as the new explanation well. The future but not expected was the continuation of our familiar anti elsewhere This negative feature was directed at the Star's Bottom's epistemic realism. The result was the exclusion of an alternative solution to the unity of science. Furthermore, it has continuously denied all chances for a final account of a persistent defense of an incurable subjectivism and related skepticism regarding the cognitive reliability of sense experience. The center of gravity has shifted in recent times to opportunities that opened up with the moving away from the search for the ultimates of experience to inquire into 
that have established for the long end of the meeting of the day of the theology, diets, non judicious afraid of the water opportunity, that presumably secures the continuity between the law and law in the sense of the world, is technically false. What makes even less sense, in his view, is the absence of the requirement to evaluate the passage I quoted from Aristotle with reference to the Dianne. Absorbing Aristotle's theory of essences into the general trends of modern philosophies of sensation can only cause confusion and unfair comparison. In the next session, I will undertake a treatment of this issue. But now, I must stress here that Aristotle's critics dismisses realism by attention to him, premises he never had. A comfortable anti Aristotelian thesis has been argued by my friend, our president, uh, the central Hilbert Putnam, in his great presentation on reality. No psychological state, properly so called, presupposes the existence of any individual other than the subject to whom the state is ascribed. I'm Professor Barbara Zulu, and this is my first sophomore uh, anti Aristotelianist this morning, which moved me indeed. Um, Aristotle mistakenly claims to have immediate knowledge of the existence of the record of terror, yet the term is said to develop an external object. Hence, Putnam's general position on psychological states supports a principle of solipsism and as such entails the rejection of the continuity between the thinking or knowing subject and the external object. All the mind can do as consciousness of its activity is to attend to its own normal entities, that is, its criminal states. Putnam's position is dialectically opposed to Aristotle's own in the DNA, whereby a sensible object is actually what the sense for them is potential. But according to that, we may think that we are talking about external objects, whereas we are actually only well, referring to internal representations. The latter one not picture of such objects are only internal mental representations. This position is known as Putnam's third big basis. The shockers of rejecting Aristotle with some of the moon on when Putnam gave his few lectures. He wrote that he would have used for the lectures the following title, quote, Aristotelian realism without Aristotelian metaphysics, end quote, indicating that the obstacle to formulating epistemological views closer to Aristotle was the latter's essential. That is the same obstacle that the Jewry had identified but few unsurpassing. The phrasing has been softened, but the criticism has lost none of its previous pattern. The criticism continues to rest in its case of a misleading, I think, of the Diana, if not non reading. And more precisely, what Aristotle says about the passion of the soul and the functions of SDC. And of the sense organs in receiving the forms of the sensible objects. But one had his guest correspondence and experience with ascension. <coughs> I open the reason in the next session to make clear why what we might have thought of spaces we can't say, especially in the concept of continuity between subject and object, between sense and soul in the sensible world. Suffice it to say at this point that Putnam's philosophy of life casts a heavy shadow of skepticism on the possibility of reviving an Aristotelian model of the unity of the sea. I trust that it has become obvious by now that the idea of the unity of the sea has reached a dead end, especially after the revival of skepticism nourished by recent philosophies of mind and their anti thesis. They gave the impetus to the 
rejection of the principle of continuity between man and causes, logic and mechanisms, experience and nature. The prospect of community supported by such a principle, by extending its efficacy beyond the domain of subjective coherence, has been deemed seemingly beyond recovery. It is clear, and I trust I'm not mistaken, that to overcome the chaos, we need a new idea. If the idea of living in the state is to come to fruition, the primary requirement would be the abandonment of the remains of the reductionist thesis along with the skepticism of the department variety. To overcome both obstacles, however formidable they seem at the present moment, we have no choice but to return to our story. But it would be an hour's common bread by you without the vocabulary of the British empiricists or the vocabulary of the heirs of the Emmanuel Kant. An hour's common bread with the full appreciation of the richness of his own texts, free from the formalisms that go back to Bohemius and the other translators. It will be an hour's common liberated from the shackles of the spectator theory of knowledge. Which John Dewey said when I was talking to the Greeks, he was convinced, as you, that uh, that speculative theory of knowledge held the ancient realism prison. It may be that, after all, the idea of infinity of every state may not be a useless letter or a hopeless program, but rather a valuable tool of cognition of praxis and creation. Since time does not permit to engage in the full exposition of the earth to keep them up, I can only underscore the concept that determines the structure and scope of the idea. As a problem, the unity of the distinct holds within the orbit of special inquiry. To understand what it does in the pursuit, we will need to replace the term CMGM in this modern setting, setting with what Aristotle meant by future philosophy. With Cynthia out of the way and the philosophy are reinforced, the next step would be to locate the new inquiry where it properly belongs as a philosophy, free from the modern metaphysical language. Placed in its proper context, the problem of unity takes the form of an operator, a Christ calling for an appropriate solution, one that differs radically from the one that was proposed and dropped in the course of the first part of our century. It should be obvious that in its full form, the discredits of Aristotle's faulty philosophy also declares unacceptable the model of unity of his deeds supports. Be that as it may, my concern all along has been not the denial, but the reaffirmation of a position to revitalize a realist interpretation of the nexus between science and philosophy by way of extended continuity. Our small doctors have been treated in countless books throughout the centuries and do not need another summation in this occasion. I can only point out the cardinal idea that the authors have never been modeled. Principally, continuities are established in two ways, vertically and horizontally in the process of cognitive experience. Vertically, cognition originates with a fact of esthesis of the sensible world, that is, with the intelligible features of this sensible world. A fact that energizes simultaneously the faculties of the soul. The intelligible continuity of the nature of the soul, from the structures and regularities of the world to the abstract concepts, universals, and principles, is what makes human orientation, human action, and cognition at once facts of nature and subject matters for investigation. What we come to know. To use our song as idiom, is to see. To see as the ultimate facts of the world. To see it and their inherent properties, their synthetic 
Both big up my head with the section of the whole other range of us, regardless of the instruments we use, be the microscopes, telescopes, statistical methods, or any other device instruments. <coughs> and it doesn't move to the universals that lie reside on the particulars. This is our job, it's real. The objectivity of such matters are better on the back of the sciences. In the horizontal, there is recognition in every science that it conforms to the rules of canonical discourse, whereby the options of extended predications is to shape the intimacy of the tools of language under the rule of both. The effort of both is to articulate the intelligibility of the world and of the world. We are now the domain of interscientific principles, their irreducibility and organization of the world. He talked about them in his metaphysics, the dilemma, in the theory of ideas, that the diversity of principles of the special sciences is warranted by the natural world and the diversity of the distinct species and gender of being that we will see it in their complex properties. This horizontal continuity, the regular that secure the nexus of interscientific inquiry and of understanding itself, is located in intelligence, in race, and in every three roles of both communal views of language and of science as the great form in our present world of human beings. Given the distinct existence, I would say, of any context, and that of the sciences that study, the modern reductionist model of humanity appears as much contrived as it is the one right. The reduction of principles to an ultimate set of axioms may suit the mathematician's ideal, but not the empirical scientist's. Furthermore, it works at the expense of intelligibility between the knowing soul and the knowable world. However, abandoning the pursuit of an alternative model of unity and understanding that could bring yet knower and reality, as is implied by the skepticism of certain philosophies of life, can only encourage subscription to an unmanageable even in the coherence of Jacobism. Such a position would leave the door open to accept as unbridgeable the aforementioned discontinuities between the sciences and the humanities, the facts and the language, the entities of theory of physics, and the objects of ordinary experience. During the matter of fact, during the past, the first chapter of the neighbors of what is known as American nationalists, and chiefly among them John Dew, sought to prevent the impasse of this unity by recommending an instrumentalist theory of knowledge, to render it vital or vital for the continuity between the precarious and the stable between being and being. Thank you. 